Welcome to the Murfreesboro City Council. Um, it is August 17th, and Councilmember Madeline Scales Harris has our prayer and our pledge. Thank you, ma'am. May we bow our heads, please. And everyone just take a moment of silence for the people in Hawaii and for our kids going back to school. Dear Heavenly Father, we just come to you just as humble and undeserving as we know how, just to say thank you, Lord. Thank you for this moment that wasn't promised to us, Lord, but your goodness and your mercy, you're allowing us to be here tonight. And I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you for the healing on my body, Lord, that uh, you awesome. You're the great physician, Lord. When you told the doctors get back and told that disease to get back, it got back, Lord. And through my treatments, you were right there with me. And I just, I can't thank you enough, Lord. Lord, we thank you for our employees. We have the greatest employees this side of heaven. And they make our city the city that it is. From the fire department to the parks and rec, the city employees and city hall, all the employees. And we thank you for all the citizens, Lord, that you have allowed to live in this great city, to make the city that the city that we are. And I thank you for that, Lord. And proving great employees tonight, we're going to honor an employee, Joel, for his outstanding service. And we thank you for that. Lord, I ask that you lift up a special prayer for Dr. Trey Duke as he gets our sister prepared for the kids for the private schools, the homeschoolers, all of our students, Lord. And just let them know, the little kids, I can't imagine going to school having fear of something happening. Let them be happy, Lord. Let them learn and impart in the teachers, Lord. Because when I think back over my life, there were teachers that made me the person that I am. We pray for the teachers, a special prayer for them. And, Lord, we ask a special prayer for the kids who are entering college for the first time, Lord. We pray for them. And let them know, Lord, that the same God, the same God that brought them 12 years in school is there waiting on them on the campuses that they are going on. And let them know they're going to run into people and, that don't think like they do, don't live like they do. But, Lord, we just ask that what they learned from their parents and their churches that it would impart in their spirit to make good choices, Lord, good choices. Lord, we just cannot thank you enough. We pray for the people that are in the nursing homes, hospitals, that are on the street. We just ask a special prayer for just our city, Lord. And Lord, as we get ready to handle our meeting, you said, where one or two are gathered, you will be in the midst. And we just ask that you be in the midst of us as we make decisions for our city, Lord. And let, like you always do, after the decisions are made, let us go back because they are just opinions. Go back and be the same loving, caring, and supporting of one another that we've always been. And Lord, as we go to our individual homes, we ask that all is well when we get there. We ask for safe travel. And Lord, you're just awesome. We just cannot thank you enough. And I just thank you for the longevity of my life. You blessed me to be in my 70s. And I cannot thank you enough, Lord, because longevity in my family is 74. I can't thank you enough, Lord. You're just awesome. I just, you know how I get when I talk to you, Lord. You're just great. And just be a protector over us, Lord. This is my prayer that I ask in your darling son's name. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, before we go to ceremonial items, I want to make one quick comment that um, there, there's been a lot of talk that we've we've talked about kids going back to school and I know director Duke is sitting there in the back I had the opportunity to talk with um, several of our police officers yesterday and 
at the beginning of the year, you know, there's a focus on safety around our schools, specifically with kids walking to school and parents driving their kids to school. That safety does not change throughout the year, but the police department puts an absolute priority to make sure that we get started in the right direction. And that's mainly to make sure that people are not on their phones, that they're paying attention, that their seat belts are buckled, just all the things I know that as, as you're watching TV and those who are sitting in the audience, it's all the things that all of us would agree that's a priority that we should do in our school zones. Well, I had the unfortunate opportunity to listen to a message that a parent sent because a parent apparently got a ticket because they weren't doing one of those things in there. And I, I'm not even gonna tell you what they called our police officers and some of the language they use. So my quick response is, if you're in a school zone, put your phone down and pay attention because the minute that you don't do that, the kid that you hit is something that not only will change their life forever, it will change your life forever. And if you're the parent who calls in and can't leave your name or who you are and say some of the things that about the police officers for them doing their job, shame on you. You need to reevaluate re reevaluate where you are in a school zone, uh, and for that matter, reevaluate where you are in your life if you're if, if you're feeling that way. So anyway, wanted to make that comment. I know our two police officers, believe it or not, they were just shaking their head that they were trying to do the right thing of protecting our kids. And, and I know the majority of us agree, but pay attention when you're in those school zones. All right, um, Randolph, I think we have a STARS award. Thank you, Mayor. Good, uh, good evening, Council. You know, Madam Scales Harry, that was an awesome uh, prayer you gave. I think you may have missed your calling. <laughs> but tonight I'm here to uh, recognize the recipient of the STARS Award for the month of July. As you know, the STARS Award uh, was created to recognize those employees who go above and beyond the call of duties as far as providing outstanding customer service to both our employees who are internal and also our external customers. Tonight's recipient is a young man who works in the planning department. Some of you know him because he often, often presents in the planning commission meeting. His name is Joel Aguilera. Joel holds the title of planner. He's been with the department now, particularly the city, for a little bit over two years. He's well liked by many in his department. You can tell that by the fan base he has over here. <laughs> there, are, there are several leaders also who are in the audience who are probably smiling and beaming and knowing that they got this situation right, this pick right, and that was, that's Sam Huddleston, Greg McKnight, and also uh, Matthew Blumey. They made the right decision in hiring Joel. Joel was nominated by two individuals in his department, once in June and another time in July. They are Holly Smith and Marina Rush. Here's what they said in, in the nomination letter that they sent to the uh, STARS Committee. They said, Joel provides top-notch customer service by enthusiastically taking all customer inquiries at the counter and on the phone at all times of the day, even if, if it interrupts his lunch. He listens intently to the customer's needs, provides clear explanation, and often translates for our department and others all in humility. If he doesn't know the precise answer, he finds the answer. He brings levity to the department and planning commission meetings and, has, and, uh, and always has a positive outlook. He is well liked and respected by the city staff that he encounters, and in serving on the Main Street Board, <laughs> he reflects a positive image of the city and the community through his personality and his knowledge. He is always seeking to learn more about the planning profession and upcoming topics to provide input that will provide the quality of life for the community. As a seasoned planner who is in earshot of much of Joel's interaction with the public, staff, and the community, I have a great deal of respect for all he brings to the job every day that provides a positive image of the government. And Joel, on a personal note, your, re your recognition tonight, let the baby boomers in the room know that there's a shining light at the end of the tumble, tunnel. You give hope to Generation Z. So ladies and gentlemen, if you would, let's recognize Joel for the recipient.
Hey, and Joel, before you leave, Joel I, can't, I, yeah, I can't say it's a first that we've not ever had a STARS Award winner with balloons. In the, uh, <laughs> as a matter of fact, I don't think I ever remember balloons ever being in the council chamber. So. I saw this and I was like, I hope it was on my birthday. <laughs> Congratulations, Joe. All right, let's move to uh, our consent agenda. You have five items on the consent agenda. Move for approval. Second. Motion is second. Please call the roll. Ms. Averwater? Aye. Ms. Gales Harris? Aye. Mr. Maxwell? Aye. Vice Mayor Shocklett? Aye. Mr. Wright? Aye. Mayor McFarland? Aye. All right, we'll move to new business. You have land use matters. You have amending the zoning ordinance, building height. Um, Mr. Blomley. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of council. Um, honored to be here among a bunch of my colleagues from the planning department. Um, Mr. Aguilera is outstanding, um, and Randolph was right that, that we got it right with him, and we have um, a whole department full of uh, great individuals, and we are um, honored um, that Joel had received this award. Um, and we're appreciative of uh, Ms. Rush and Ms. Smith uh, nominating him. Very well deserved for him. Um, our first public hearing tonight is uh, for a zoning ordinance amendment. It is for uh, a couple purposes. Um, it is for to uh, amend our zoning ordinance so that uh, there is no maximum building height requirement for structures that are associated with government utilities and government public safety. Uh, you know, one of the one of the mantras of the planning of uh, the planning profession or zoning is when um, you have um, the same request for a variance over and over again. It's probably time to revisit the ordinance. Um, so over the over the years, we've had a number of requests for height variances for water towers. Mr. Gore can attest to that. Um, height variances for emergency communications towers. The police department can attest to that. And so because of the overarching public benefit of these structures and because of the fact that it is extremely hard for an applicant to meet the burden of proof in order to obtain a height variance, and that puts our Board of Zoning Appeals in a little bit of a sticky situation. And so in reviewing the um, ordinance, uh, what we are proposing is to uh, exempt those types of structures, structures that are um, for use in, con in conjunction with a government a uh, utility or a government public safety agency from our maximum height requirements. And this would eliminate the need for um, governments to come before the Board of Zoning Appeals for height variances every time for these structures. The other change that we're proposing to make, as I mentioned, height variances are extremely difficult to prove. Um, when a new cell tower is proposed, the applicant must go before the Board of Zoning Appeals for both a special use permit and a height variance. So the special use permit process allows the board to put appropriate conditions on the approval of a, of a uh, cell tower. So they already have the ability to limit the height that's proposed and there's really no need, it's kind of redundant to put them in a position to have to act on a height variance as well when they already have the ability to limit the height via conditions on the special use permit. So those are the two main purposes of the, uh, of the proposed ordinance amendment. Uh, the Planning Commission conducted a public hearing on this matter on August the 2nd and then voted to recommend approval of this ordinance amendment um, to the City Council. I'll be happy to answer any questions before or after our public hearing. Any questions for Mr. Blomley? All right, we'll need to hold a public hearing on this zoning ordinance, um, <coughs> the amendment. So the way we handle all of our public hearings, if you're, uh, we'll need you to come to the podium. Um, you'll state your name and your address. You'll have three minutes, uh, if, unless you're part of a, an HOA group or an association or a, a group, you're representing a group of people, then with that, you'll have five minutes. I'll keep the timer. Uh, we just asked you to be respectful of, of the time. <coughs> so anyone wishing to speak for this, uh, against this zoning ordinance, if you'll please come to the podium. All right, seeing none, we'll close, close the public hearing. We'll now consider on first reading <coughs> Ordinance 23026. Move for approval. Second. Motion is second. Please call the roll. 
Miss Averwater? Aye. Miss Gales Harris? Aye. Mr. Maxwell? Aye. Vice Mayor Shacklett? Aye. Mr. Wright? Aye. Mayor McFarland? Aye. All right, we'll, we'll move to rezoning property west of Memorial Boulevard. Uh, this is uh, 34.2 acres. Mr. Blomley. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, our second public hearing is for the rezoning of the same property that you saw before you back in December of last year uh, to rezone the property that's currently zoned RS-15, single-family residential district with minimum lot sizes of 15,000 square feet to PRD, planned residential district. The, uh, the request that you um, reviewed back in December uh, was met with some opposition um, by the public uh, for a number of reasons, um, including the connection to the, uh, the five street stubs that stub into the property, as well as uh, some of the exceptions that the applicant was requesting, um, the lot sizes and the density, and the street, uh, the street, the street network. So the applicant uh, went back to the drawing board, and uh, normally there's an 18-month waiting period before uh, an applicant can come back uh, and resubmit a zoning request for the same property um, unless that time frame is waived by the planning director. Um, uh, Mr. McKnight worked diligently with the, uh, with the applicants to uh, refine their plan, um, address some of the public's concerns and some of council's concerns, and because of that, the 18-month waiting period was waived. Um, some of those changes uh, I'll go over in just a moment. Um, but just to orient you a little bit further on the, uh, on the location of the property, as Mr. Mayor mentioned, it's west of Memorial Boulevard. It's directly to the west of the Family Worship Center. Uh, it's directly to the south of the Regency Estates subdivision in Regal Drive, directly to the uh, east of the Regency Park subdivision, and directly to the north of the Palmer Heights subdivision. And so you see the five street stubs are the unnamed street off of Regal Drive, Archer Avenue, Amber Drive, Banner Drive, and Tower Drive. Uh, the um, proposed development um, is for single-family residential homes on lots a minimum of 12,000 square feet. And that is one of the differences between, the, um, between the, the plan that was presented to you in December and the plan that's presented to you today is that they have increased the minimum lot size to 12,000 square feet and decreased the number of lots by 11, I believe, down to 85. Um, they've decreased the number of exceptions that they're asking for, and uh, they have also eliminated all front entry garages. So all of the homes will, be, will contain side entry garages. Uh, Mr. Clyde Roundtree will go over the um, the specific specifics of the plan in just a moment. I did want to mention that the adopted future land use map of the uh, Murfreesboro 2035 comprehensive plan recommends that this property develop as suburban residential land use character. Uh, the density that they are proposing is in line with the suburban residential land use character, which recommends uh, developments that are um, the equivalent of RS10, RS12, and RS15. And so these uh, these lots fall within the range of uh, what the Murfreesboro 2035 plan recommends. Uh, in bringing this plan back to you today, uh, one of the things that the planning department has continued to av advocate for is the uh, street connections to the five stub streets. Uh, it has been um, our policy, our adopted policy, to extend stub streets into developments uh, when a stub street uh, dead ends into an undeveloped property. Our, um, our subdivision regulations uh, require that stub streets be extended or terminated in a cul-de-sac. Our design guidelines require that the stub streets be extended. And our major transportation plan strongly encourages connectivity. And uh, in this instance, it's a way to uh, distribute traffic among the, uh, among the north, east, west, and south of the subject property. Uh, uh, I will mention that Mr. Ram Balachandra, the city's traffic engineer, is here. He uh, reviewed the, uh, the traffic impact study that was submitted to the city by the applicant, and uh, he'll be happy to answer any questions from a city standpoint regarding the, uh, the traffic and the traffic distribution either before or after the public hearing. Uh, and I'll be happy to answer any questions as well. Uh, I'd like to invite Mr. Clyde Roundtree with Huddleston Steel Engineering to
go through the specifics of the development plan. Council members, my name is Clyde Roundtree, Ellison Steel Engineering. I thank you, Matthew, for the introduction. Appreciate the opportunity to come back and present to you Northridge Park. This has been a, a, a real interesting process moving through this development, working with planning staff, working with council, working with uh, the neighbors, and trying to find consensus on a project that we feel like is a real asset to Murfreesboro. As far as my background on this particular piece of property, I just want to say that I think that the consensus around the neighborhood is that it's not necessarily a negative project. I think they see the positives in terms of the quality of the homes. They know we've made a lot of concessions as far as moving forward with reducing density and trying to increase the lot sizes to make them more consistent with the adjacent neighborhood. Uh, what we found is that there's a lot of issues over circulation and traffic and how it's going to move through the neighborhood and how it's going to impact the adjacent neighbors. So we'll get to that in more detail, but I'll just walk you through the highlights of the plan. As Matthew mentioned, right now, I think that the, the critical point is that this is an existing lot that we're convinced that if it doesn't develop by Brightland Homes, we're pretty convinced that it can be developed really soon by somebody. So we've been trying to encourage the whole process that with the plan development allows us to have some controls that if it went bulk zoning, you wouldn't have. So as a result of going through a plan development versus a bulk zoning, we're basically reducing the, the overall home count by about seven. So if you had RS-15 versus RS-12, there's about seven homes that are in the balance. Uh, we've expressed to the neighbors, we've also expressed to as many folks as we can that although that's not everything you want in terms of the development, when you go to RS-15 with a bulk zone, the home qualities can go down significantly. So that's one thing we really wanted to kind of emphasize. The overall master plan, there's been multiple changes as a result of community feedback. The biggest ones I want to just note are that, you know, originally there was real concern about connections on from Osborne Lane into the subdivision. That road section has become wider. It's going to be a, it's going to feed commercial on both sides potentially in the future. We, uh, we, we also put a traffic calming medium in that, that new road. All that was in response to making sure that this neighborhood, if it comes online, does not become a through a throughway onto Banner. Originally, the concept had a basically a left turn right when you came to the subdivision, and a right turn, and then you're right on Banner, cruising out of the subdivision. We realized that could be a potential hazard. That was that was identified by the neighbors, and as a result, the road network changed significantly. So that's one big change, but that's a, that's a major change in terms of how the neighborhood would perform, and that's a direct result of feedback from the neighbors. As far as the other things that neighbors really weighed in on is this where the amenity center is, and we've moved it. We're on our second location for the amenity center. Originally, it was in the back portion of the property, and they felt like that was way too close to the, all the, you know, it was, it was one of those things where they felt like it was a bad location. So we moved it to the front of the subdivision, really more closer, closely to the commercial area. Um, that's come under some critique because that, the thought is, is that now Archer's gonna become more of a thoroughfare because people are gonna be going to that mailbox. But with that in mind, it was a response to trying to make sure that we address the concerns, initial concerns of the neighbors. As far as the overall development, we had originally, um, we had, I think, we had 11 lots that were front entry garages. I think I've mentioned this before, but the developer for this particular subdivision, if it, it comes to pass, is out of the Dallas area. So they're building $700,000, $800,000 homes with front entry garages. They didn't see that as peculiar. But we know in this area, our preference is for side entry garages. So in the process of, of, of moving through this, we realized that we needed to do all side entry garages. That was a major concession that was made by the developer. It did result in a reduction of lots. We still have the ability to do the side entry garages. We feel like the home quality will still remain high. And as a result, none of the elevations have any sort of semblance of a, of a garage on the front. So with that in mind, these are high quality homes. We believe the starting price is gonna be somewhere in the 700,000 mark. So as far as our background, this is something that we've been told would be wonderful for Murfreesboro. Single family detached homes of a high quality, all masonry, high end, development 
This is not a townhome development. This is not a small rent to own development. This is a high quality single family home development that in our opinion is, is something that we've been encouraged to try to seek. I think Murfreesboro should be proud to have something like this. Unfortunately, it is development. It's a pastor that's a field right now, but we know something's gonna happen. So I think the decisions tonight really come down to, you know, quality over quantity. It comes down to, you know, a PRD with controls versus a bulk zone. And ultimately, I'm not convinced that if we went with a bulk zone with larger lots, that those stub streets would be taken care of any differently. I would like to reflect on the fact that today I spoke to um, one of the uh, fire marshals and asked them specifically about stub streets and how they perform. And, and if it's a mandatory requirement, is there anything in the, in the ordinance or in their basically code of, code of performance, whether if there's a stub street, it has to stay open. And they said specifically that that's really not a concern for them. The, the fact that this has five stub streets is really positive. The fact that there are two along the uh, the southern property line, that's going to be the point of contention tonight primarily, and Amber and Archer, <coughs> they said that if one of those was closed and the other one stayed open, they feel like that would help, that would be performing well. Again, their preference would be to have them open, but it's not a, it's not a, it's not something that if that were to go, uh, they would feel like it's, it's a horrible decision. But with us, we've been found, our, we found ourselves in this process with, I think, a great project. It's kind of stuck in the middle between, you know, the character of the existing neighborhood and the quality of the existing neighborhood, the introduction of something new, and primarily the, the issues have been related to traffic and really specifically related to those stub streets. We know it's a city policy, as Matthew mentioned, for those connections to be made. So, and the developer doesn't feel like if, the, if, this, if, if you recommend us to drop one of them, that's not gonna change the development. They're still gonna come. One of the things I just wanna bring to, bring to light that's really become very real to us is that this is our third generation on this project. We've gone through multiple revisions. Every time we've reduced the amount of, uh, we've reduced the amount of lots, we've changed the circulation patterns, and we come back to kind of the same issue. So as you hear from the neighbors, we appreciate their involvement. We've had two neighborhood meetings. We've met with some of the neighbors individually. There's been a lot of interaction. They're very active, and they should be. They've got a wonderful community. They got beautiful homes. It's, a, it's an established neighborhood, and they're super concerned that when this gets built, all of a sudden it's gonna really change the dynamics of their homes, and I can appreciate that. But at the same time, we can appreciate the fact that something's gonna happen, and really it's a matter of what do we want to happen and we know with planned developments, we have a little bit more control for quality than we would if it was just bulk zoning. With that in mind, I'm gonna ask Chris McGuire from Huddleston Steel to come up real quickly and kind of walk through some of the concerns over traffic and some of the concerns over drainage. Thank you all. Chris McGuire with Huddleston Steel Engineering. Um, the lead engineer on the project, um, I think Matthew Blomley and uh, Clyde Roundtree both touch bases on most of the elements that I would touch base on. Um, I guess, as you'll hear, the main concern is about traffic. Uh, we've worked very hard to try to hear everybody out that we possibly could. Um, of course, we have the restriction from planning and the, and the uh, subregs that we have to make all connections. We also hired an independent third-party engineer with no vested interest in this development to run an analysis. And uh, the analysis came out to say that they recommend we make every connection. <clears throat> and in speaking with him, his primary reason for making every connection is, say we close down one of them, that now puts a percentage that could have gone a different direction into the other ones. So instead of dispersing all of the traffic at five points, we'll disperse it at four and increase the traffic to others. So as from the, from the study's findings, from the subdivision regulations, this is the iteration that keeps coming back is all of the stubs need to be tied to. Um, the main concern from the last council meeting that I heard was the connection from Osborne to Banner. We've now made it four turns to be able to get through this development to get to Banner. At this point, I think you might as well turn down Memorial and get on Regency and go around. Uh, we've, with all the twists and turns that we've created, it really makes it not advantageous for people on Osborne to come through. 
Um, the other concern that we have heard a lot about is drainage. Um, we've been to multiple neighborhood meetings. Uh, I've also been in some of their homes watching their videos of their flooding issues. Uh, we've evaluated a lot of the drainage in the area to make sure that we're really understanding the scope of the local issue. Um, and I've spoke with many of them. I, I feel like with this development, we have the ability <coughs> to help solve some of these drainage issues. Now, of course, we can't uh, fix everything, but I feel like we can provide solutions that will potentially provide some relief. Uh, one of those items that we had done is we've increased our pond by 10 to 20 percent. Um, we have all intentions of providing relief pipes for properties to the southeast corner and relief ditches. We've also heard concerns on the southeast corner of drainage flooding and we have uh, planned to uh, provide relief piping throughout the development to carry that to our pond. and. Um, I, I feel like we can really make some positive improvements. Um, I'm open to any questions if anyone has any. Um, I really appreciate y'all's time. Any questions? Claude, I have two questions. Page, page two, or excuse me, page 17 of your, your uh, plan book shows, or if you want to bring up this, there you go. Um, page 17 shows a different layout than what the other, some of the other layouts it shows where you can come off of Osborne and take a left and then it's a straight shot back to Banner. That's not the plan we're looking at, is That's it? That's correct. That's from the traffic study, so that was probably older. So the, so just to be clear that when, when we're considering this, we're considering the, the new plan that doesn't have that direct connection. Because right. there's three or four pl pages I wrote down that have a different site plan than what the one that we're considering. Okay, that's true. <laughs> yeah, it was, that was embedded in the traffic study. So, uh, Mayor, if you would just look at the site plan that's currently, I, I just lost control. How did I lose control? Yeah. So, um, yeah. yeah, the main site plan is the one. This one here. Yeah, not the one that's got the straight. Yeah, okay. On page Correct. seven. You said, which page? The traffic study was based on the old layout, so I think okay. it would be more favorable now that the, uh, the, li the realignment was done. Okay. Well, I got a question. You, you brought this up. So <clears throat> if this isn't developed as a PRD, then who is this person that's going to swoop in and develop it as RS-15 and we don't have any control over it? I've, I've heard that from some other council members. I've heard it from you. I just kind of more, for the record, like, who is it? Because I kind of take it as a threat that if we don't do this, this is what's going to happen. So help me understand where that's coming from. As far as I can't disclose who that person is, um, I haven't heard it directly. I've heard it as well, Austin, that there's a, uh, I think what happens typically, especially in a lot like this, because it's so prime yeah. that people are paying attention to it. They know it's been denied once formerly. They know it's prime for the pump. So I think developers kind of watch and go, all they're asking for is RS-15. We can come in. The vulnerability of RS-15 is because it's not a planned development, there are still some regulations regarding housing quality but there's not a regulation for side entry garages. There's, not a, there's really not a regulation for minimum house sizes. And so our concern candidly with that, because I think it's a, it's a reality that we believe is true, whether we can prove it or not, we believe it's true. And as a result of that, because some of the neighbor's concerns was adjacent property value, is their home value gonna go down? We feel like with the current proposal with the PRD, we have no concern about it going down. If it becomes a bulk zone, we can't give them any assurance that that's the case. And I, I've heard the threat is going to go to a rental community. I'm not convinced of that. But I am convinced that there's someone in the, in the shadows that will be ready to jump on this if it gets to die tonight. It's just a reality. And again, I think we're saving seven homes by making that decision. But we're losing a lot of control as, to, as far as the quality. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. To me, 
in a subdivision five entrances, it's just too many. Uh, how many subdivisions do we have in Murfreesboro at this size, about 85 homes? Do we have five ways to get in and out? It, it just doesn't make sense to me. I can see three, but five? Madeline, I, I, I would say this. I think that this is so unique because of how established the neighborhood is around it. Um, obviously, those stub streets were designed to be connected. There's not a question about that. Whether it was always going to be one neighborhood or two neighborhoods based on the 34 acres, it could have been broken up in different parcels in that regard. And to your point, uh, it's just unique to have so much established around it. I think that makes this a lot unique to anything, or anything else I've worked on in Murfreesboro. Also to your point, and that's why I think is one thing to consider is, and I think, you know, I, like I mentioned, Archer and Amber have been the ones that the primary, I'd say Archer has been one of major concern just because it's closer to the amenity center, that those are both on the southern property line. There may be a chance that one could be done and one not. I think the fire department would love to have a secondary access point along every side. So we have two on the north, we have two, well, we have one on the north, two on the south, and, and two on the west. And then obviously Osborne Lane connection to the east. So that would be the question mark that's out there. Is, is five too many? Is four enough? Is three enough? I can't really answer the question. Like Chris said, the traffic study said, all that does, the more, the more exit points from the neighborhood, the more diversify the traffic. It just gives you more options to get out. But we know that basically the concern is that Amber and Archer are substandard roads in terms of there's no sidewalk, there's, there's bar ditches. So now you're coming out of a new subdivision with a larger road section with sidewalks going into an old established neighborhood that doesn't have that. So the concern is that that's creating a traffic, that's a situation that's not optimum as far as people walking through the neighborhood, but there's no way to get off the road. If someone parks on the road, it changes the character of the road. So those are valid concerns, except for, you know, we're going by the city regulations for road widths. And again, the encouragement's always been to keep those connections open. But to your point, it sounds excessive. I um, personally measured Archer and uh, Amber. I mean, it's squeezed already. And in, the, in that neighborhood, people, it's a lot of elderly people, it's a lot of retired people. And it's, I'm beginning, it's a lot of young people. And right now the road is so narrow if you take a, and families walk in that neighborhood a lot, the children, elderly walk, and if they are walking and you try to get two cars passing, that's just kind of impossible. Mm -hmm. Now, you're talking about a subdivision with no sidewalks. Right. So that's even worse. And even though, you know, it was planned to stub that out, but I can understand that. But we have to look at the present the people that live there, and the safety of the people in the community. And it's just not safe. And as far as fire apparatus and um, animals, they've been going through there for years. And I haven't, I mean, complaint. I mean, they picked me up a few times. Yeah. And, <laughs> and so, I mean, it's never an uh, issue of uh, animals or a fire truck getting in and out of there. but. And then as people already go around Archer with that curve, mm -hmm. I mean, they go around like they, they're flying. Right. So I, I just don't see the need to take the studs out. I, I'd like to see the neighborhood like it is, stay like it is. Can we I? did, uh, I, I did talk to Chief Lowe about you know, it, would it be advantageous to do some kind of controlled access for emergencies? Because uh, again, they would love to have more access, the better tree falls, they have another way to get there, a tornado comes through and there's debris. He said he really is not in favor of having any kind of controlled access just because there's maintenance involved and, you know, next thing you know, it's not working. So, um, but again, he, he thought by having two, it's wonderful, but by having one, he still feels like he can get in there from another direction if he needs to. So he, he basically said, both that. I mean, he, he would love to have them, but he's willing to go with less if necessary. Again, that comes back to really city policy and really the directive we've been given to try to hold them open. Mr. Mr. Huddleston, a quick question. 
We, we've gotten, first of all, for all the neighbors out there, thank you all for all the emails and information that you've all sent us. There's been a lot talked about drainage and specifically I drive through, I take a 10 year old to school every single morning and I, <coughs> I'm down Sulphur Springs Road and I get to Haynes Drive. So I don't do that anymore because you can't make a left turn during school hours. So I drive through Jamison Place and then I cross Regency Park and I drive through Palmer Heights and I every single day to be able to get on the Haynes Drive to miss all that. And every time I drive through Palmer Heights, especially when it rains, I think about over the last 15 years, we've had a lot of discussion about the homes in Palmer Heights that back up to the property that fronts Memorial where high V is going to go. <clears throat> we also had several years ago, State Farm wanting to do a project that they were going to bore up underneath Memorial. Can you tell us where that drainage project is? We were, if I remember, we approved with Huddleston Steel an engineering plan going all the way down the Thompson Lane to alleviate that drainage issue in Palmer Heights. Can you update us on that? Sure, yes, that was part of the uh, North Murfreesboro drainage study. Uh, the project uh, study we initiated in the 2010 time frame. Uh, we developed a concept plan and then moved that into uh, uh, design and have, uh, have put several place pieces in place to actually start construction. Uh, we slowed down on that as the high V project came through because uh, of their uh, potential work and, uh, and we have proposed a, a uh, project development agreement with hy V that would require them to construct basically the plan that, that we had uh, proposed and some of the elements of roadway improvements. And, uh, and they would do that with their project rather than us conflicting with their construction. Uh, I think Mr. Griffith may be uh, here tonight and he, he may have a little additional, additional information on how far we've developed into that uh, uh, agreement. I know that, that hy V has uh, been working through some of their permitting and final plans review process. Uh, we haven't brought that development agreement, obviously, to this body yet for approval, but it's, uh, it's, uh, the concept is out there. That takes the, 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 the old Haynes property, or the Haynes property where the, you've got the undeveloped property behind or over where Iron Gate and the Kroger, that you've, we staked, or I remember seeing stakes along Haynes Drive across from Stones River, the Stones River Manor. Stones River, Stones River Manor, correct. And, and that drainage project would go behind all of those homes all the way down. How far does it go down? Our project now would take it um, very nearly to the edge of this property uh, along the um, uh, corner and, and I'm gonna borrow Mr. Roundtree's <coughs> proposal or presentation here while it's up and it, it would, it would interact with that property in, in that corner as I recall and then um, this project would pick it up from there obviously having the ability to manage the um, the water that's coming through there with their their design okay I, I just wanted the residents to know that that's North Murfreesboro drainage project has been something that's been in design because there's a lot of projects that have come up Memorial that have been either told I mean, at one point, I think there was a Publix that was looking at going on that property. And, That's correct. And once they started researching the drainage that would have to be completed to make that work, they said no. State Farm stopped their project at one point that they were going to do. And now that this is progressing along, that will alleviate that that portion of so, where Some of that drainage. portion, yes, certainly the uh, um, uh, ability for us to, to do this as well helps with our need to improve Haynes Drive in that area. And one of the challenges we have there is managing the runoff from the uh, streets uh, and making sure that has a, a safe and proper place to go. And so we, we saw the, uh, <coughs> the, the larger drainage project as a significant benefit to the city um, to help us manage that, that situation there in Palmer Heights and the uh, Haynes and Memorial property, as well as giving us an outlet for some of the drainage uh, that would need to come from Haynes Drive itself. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. We'll open our public hearing. Uh, anyone wishing to speak for or against, if you'll come to the podium, if you will, um, state your name, your address, and then you can ha you'll have three minutes.
Okay. Uh, my, name is Mike ba- my name is Mike Bacon. I'm at 2814 Archer Avenue. Uh, I've sent all of y'all a couple of uh, emails of, about our concerns, and I'm just going to hit on a couple of points. I'm not going <laughs> to read the five-page email, but uh, one, I-, I hear about the traffic study, but I feel like it it misses the point of the admin, uh, the, the I'll call it the mailbox center, uh, and that future development you're discussing on Haynes and how that will change people cutting down Morgan and cutting down Archer and going through. So I, so I keep stand by my position that says Archer doesn't need to go through. You're going to destroy a walking neighborhood and also put a lot of people's safety in jeopardy walking those streets. You just sit there and watch the people walk, as you I heard uh, Ms. Harris talk about. Um, the other thing, uh, we talk about uh, fire access and stuff uh, and, and trees falling. I, I was giving an example. We had a tree fall. Um, Saturday, I think, uh, across the street. The fire department didn't know anything about it because the neighbors t- took it out. Um, third thing I'd like to address is the uh, uh, the flooding at my house in my corner. I sent y'all pictures today to talk about that and concern. Uh, I know the uh, you just mentioned the North Murfreesboro drainage project and uh, the drawing I see in front of me that uh, that shows where I think Mr. Hulson circled. I don't think that's right where he circled. I, I, I've been told that the drainage project doesn't go to the property directly behind my home. It stops at the property on up to the, what direction that would be, toward down, I don't know, uh, south, yeah, south, toward south. Uh, it doesn't go all the way behind my home. So I feel like there's a void there that, that I'm kind of trapped in. I'm trapped with a house that's gonna be right bes- beside me in a worse condition I could have with asphalt and drainage. And I know we're talking about building the home to where uh, the high point won't be there, but I still have the asphalt and everything that'll be there in the concrete. And then now the topo map shows that it runs at an angle right behind my property. And I've got the big pond behind me that you saw in the photographs of how it was flooded that comes into my backyard. So, so I feel like there's a void of discussion of the property right behind me and what's gonna happen and how it could affect everything and not do anything but cause future grief for me personally in our personal home. So, uh, so I, I, I'd end with just saying, you know, Amber doesn't need to go through. I mean, that, that's just, that, that I feel strongly about that, and I think a lot of people will say the same thing, and you've seen the reasons why in my letter. Uh, and the second is the uh, concern about the home right next to me. Could that lot be made a little bit bigger? I'm not against the, the development changing to, to a PRD. I just would hope that that home could be pushed a little further away from my home uh, with all the asphalt because of all the drainage concerns because I don't feel like there are, I feel like there's a disconnect. I feel like it won't all be addressed. Right. Thank you. You're referencing lots 30, 31, and 32. Those are the, are those the three behind you? What's that? 30, 31, and 32. Uh, the one directly behind me, I can't read it. It's south, it's, southwest corner. You're in the southwest. 57. It's one directly behind me is 57. 57. Is the one that they're developing. But then you've got the house directly behind us is the one that's uh, southeast. It's not. It, it's for sale right now. It's the property across from the speedway. Uh, it, also property. Okay. And so I, I was always told it wasn't part of the drainage development that was the study that was done that, that Mr. Olson spoke of. All right. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Trakin. All right. Hi, my name is Beverly Burke. I live at 2822 Regency Park Drive in Murfreesboro. Uh, I sent a letter to the city council and attached a couple of videos. And so I'm not gonna hash out the details of what I'm talking about, but my husband Rick Moffitt here and I live at that southwest corner. And those uh, three lots right behind our house are in a spot, especially the one uh, lot 30 right behind our house is one with low ground where the during the storm the water collects and uh, I'm here today I've talked to people and I've especially talked to Mr. McGuire so this is this is not a new thing you've heard me talk before I just want to make sure that we do not lose focus on this particular spot in the southwest corner because it needs a great deal of attention because it it's very troublesome in terms of uh, stormwater runoff. And I would like to continue to have the attention focused on it. Mr. McGuire uh, has talked to me quite a bit about what the plans are. I wanna make sure that those uh, uh, drainage plans are implemented in the best way possible to protect us. 
and I do appreciate the attention that everyone has given to this project. Uh, I want to say that there's a, uh, there's a lot to be pleased with, with the, uh, what they've proposed about the development, but there are some concerns, some legitimate concerns that the neighbors have, and I do appreciate so much the attention that you've given to it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Burt. My name is Karen Bingham. I'm at 2903 Amber Drive behind them. So my concerns are the same as I've got a page of remarks here and I'm going to sort of throw it out the window because it's been said, but I feel obliged to repeat it for all of you because they are really serious issues to us. Our properties, when it rains hard, have 50 feet of running water between them. Um, so that southwest corner is a really serious concern. Chris mentioned the southeast corner and the mediation you might be able to make there, but you didn't say anything about the southwest. Um, the city has done a lot of work since that torrential rainfall we had in January, and it has helped. I had water a half an inch beneath my front door sill then. Um, and the, the work that has been done by the city since then really does seem to have helped. My front yard still floods some, but not close to the house. But the back and the side is a torrent of moving, racing water when it rains hard. Um, so I also am interested in the focus being on this and some kind of assurance that this will actually be addressed if this proposal is passed. I'm also really concerned about the traffic issue. Um, I'm a former runner and I walk regularly. I, I took a, um, a couple of mornings this week and as I was having my coffee, watched and counted how many people are on the streets in Palmer Heights in the morning during rush hour. Um, there were 10 or 12 every morning from elderly to people pushing strollers. These are narrow streets, as has been said, with steep ditches in some places. There is no place for people to go. And city ordinances, traffic studies, whatever, um, I think you have to take into account the nature of this neighborhood, this older established neighborhood, and the safety of individuals who live and have a lifestyle that they they don't want disrupted, but, I mean, and the safety of the residents is a primary concern. Um, I agree that 85 houses, five, five or six access points seems really unnecessary given the nature of the surrounding areas. So you, you could make an amendment to keep those stub streets open. It would be really to our benefit. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bingham. Thank you so much for your time and for this esteemed body to listen to us as taxpayers and voters. We certainly appreciate it. The political climate today is one that is very, uh, let's just say suspicious. And unfortunately, <laughs> it does seem to, um, our faith in each other has taken a blow. Um, that being said, I have broken the rule. My name is Pat Bacon at 2814 Archer. My loving husband just reminded me, and I appreciate that, Michael. And we live on Archer. <laughs> and so we are very concerned about a lot of things. The safety is important to us. Um, what is important to us is my 83-year-old neighbor that takes a walk with her son every single morning, midday, I've seen her out there, and sometimes at night and uh, she's 83 and she can outwalk me. And I respect that, I respect the lifestyles these people have established. We're getting young people in there by droves with their children on skateboards, riding beside mom and dad. It is a climate that is worth holding on to. I am hearing a lot of things about I think, I think, I think. Well, I know 
what is happening in Archer, and I know what's happening in Amber, and I know what's happening in Palmer Heights. What will happen is, without a doubt, the people in Osborne will discover a thoroughfare. They will discover no stop signs. They will discover no reason to stop at all. They will choose that over Memorial. They will fly down Archer. They will get their mailboxes, and then they will go directly to one of their 85 homes. Uh, Osborne will discover us, and they will find that they can cut back through us and not deal with Haynes and Memorial anymore. And when High V is developed and the roads are developed around High V, we will have traffic in front of us, we will have traffic behind us. And I'm telling you, at night, I hear Memorial now with their race cars and it wakes me up in my back bedroom. So we are definitely changing a lifestyle and just because we can is not a reason to take a stub street and make it through. I would like to see a copy of the city ordinance that says that this is required. I would very much like to see that for this esteemed body to see that tonight and for the voters and the people here. And I appreciate so much your time. And again, remember the safety, remember our faith in you. I don't think it's misplaced. The last time that we were here, this esteemed body represented their voters in this city with honor. Your decision, whatever it is tonight, I will not hold it against you because Ms. Harris, you said it all. We represent Murfreesboro and you represent Murfreesboro. And I'm holding you to that. Thank you, Miss. And you can hold me. Thank you. My name is Ginger Richardson Palmer. I live at 2803 Archer Avenue. I've lived there for many years. My house was built in 1978. Those roads were put in in the early 70s. The sub, the sub uh, streets were thought about in the 70s, early 70s. That's 50 years ago. They, at that time, were not considering what would be going on in 2023. I'd also like to thank all of the council members for listening and helping us with this problem. You will hear comments from the builders' representatives about an analysis how great everything is with their plan. They state how they have traffic impact studies done and that this is the best plan. That's because they don't know our city. I say they can get plans on traffic to say anything they want. They want them to say. There are six outlets. This rep this right here represents the area that they're talking about. One, two, three, four, five, and then six. This is the main entrance into the area. Why do they need six in and outs for this subdivision? I'm gonna tell you because I live there, how people are going to get in and out of their, out of their uh, neighborhoods. They're going to zip up here and hop on Regency or up here because they're heading to Nashville. Most of them work in Nashville. They'll head out, they'll head up Haines and go into Nashville. But guess what? When they're coming home, you know what they do? Oh, I'm sorry. Let's not forget about Osborne. Osborne's right down here. They need to go to Nashville, so they're going to zip over this, over Memorial. They're going to take a left on Archer, 
in the mornings and come straight down Archer, right through here, stop at the stop sign, maybe, and then go on Morgan, which is, of course, also a narrow road and a curvy road that has a big old tree right here that I've almost gotten hit several times when I've been walking there. And then they'll cause a big line right here, and then they'll dart off to Nashville. On the way home, guess what they're gonna do? As I would do, because guess what? I live here. I know it's not an analysis, it's truth. Miss Palmer. Nashville. Thank you so much. Nashville here, down to Ar Morgan, down to Archer, and then right over here to get their mailbox. Yes, ma'am. Archer cannot handle it. People will die. Thank you, Miss Palmer. Thank you so much. I'm not smiling at your presentation. I'm smiling that you were drawing as he was trying to go down. So <laughs> I, I, I want to give I want to give I want to give your presenter in the back. I'd like to the, thank my husband. The arm the arms. Yeah, you've got your workout for being able to hold that up for three minutes. <laughs> Uh, good evening, Keith Palmer, uh, 2803 Archer Avenue. Appreciate uh, the chance to speak. Um, I emailed the council a, a brief um, uh, PDF today. Hope you had a chance to look at it. Appreciate those of you who did respond. Uh, my concern is the traffic mainly on Archer and Amber. Uh, it's been well discussed, narrow streets. Uh, on Amber, close to where the Stub Street is, a lot of young kids play in the street. I have to stop and uh, let them move out of the way when I'm on my way to Publix or wherever. Um, so I think additional traffic to uh, Amber for sure because of that reason and the fact that it is narrow and it's a long way. If you're coming out of the proposed subdivision and you're going down Amber to get to Haynes, there's a lot of turns you have to do to get over there. I mean, you can turn right and get on the Regency Park, but um, uh, if you go straight down Amber, you still have to make a couple of turns. My primary concern is Archer, because that's my street. And this particular subdivision doesn't, um, doesn't have a lot to do, but a lot of people aren't talking about. There's another stub street on Archer right in front of my house. So my understanding is that eventually that will be open, especially with high V coming. I don't know for sure how it's going to happen, when it's going to happen, but that's going to be more traffic that's going to uh, be coming into that narrow street, no sidewalks, what we've all heard. And I don't really understand, again, how uh, it's necessary for five entrances into this neighborhood. Six. Six. Um, and I understand that, like, an apartment complex is private or whatever, but there's the park apartments not far away from there. There's one entrance to Memorial. There's another one that goes behind um, Aldi. That's two, and that, that development that apartment has over 300 units, and my last check was that they were at about 90% occupancy. So uh, I just think it's completely unnecessary, especially for Amber and Archer, to be open if this project goes forward. And I would ask for that not to happen, uh, however you vote tonight, and that, that's what I would I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Palmer. My name is Kathleen Deneen. I live at 2810 Archer Avenue, and I wrote an email to all of you last week. Um, I'm not going to say anything else because Ms. Harris said everything there is to say about our situation, and it's the safety of the people who walk the neighborhood which is the majority of the people, I would say. And that's all I've got to say, except remember us when you are voting. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Tell me your last name again. I, I know Miss Kathleen. Deneen. Deneen, okay. I-N-E-E-N. -E -E Thank you, Miss Deneen. <coughs> Anyone else wishing to speak? May I speak? Yes, ma'am. My name is Eleanor Elliott, 407 Archer Avenue in Murfreesboro, and I'm so grateful you're all here. I thank the people that are doing the new subdivision. It sounds beautiful, but I too am opposed to Amber and Archer being opened. I walk 
I am a registered nurse of 55 years. I've seen a lot of what happens when people get hit by cars. I've seen a lot of death. Maiming is the worst. Um, I almost was killed on, on, on Archer. My daughter, my grandson, myself, and my little dog were walking. There are big ditches on the side, so you can't really gut off. But when people are driving an Archer in Amber, if there's two cars coming, one will stop so that pedestrians can go. This particular day, this person did not stop. There was a car behind me, there was a car coming the other way. And we were in a single file, and the person didn't stop, and practically knocked us right off the street. And I, the, the man behind me pulled up ahead and he said, I am so sorry that happened. He said, this must be someone that doesn't live in the neighborhood. Because in our neighborhood, if you see people walking and you live in that neighborhood, you're very, very conscious of the fact those streets are too damn narrow. Excuse my language. They are too They'll beep narrow. it out. <laughs> thank you for, I, I feel, thank you so much, Ms. Harris, for everything, the beautiful prayers. Uh, the city, we come from California, I'm from Jersey, so I'm a northerner, and I just love Murfreesboro. And again, um, the subdivision is a beautiful one, how lovely. But you don't need to, you do not need to open Archer and Amber, thank you. Thank you, Miss Elliott. All right, we have a, a race to the podium. <laughs> Lady, ladies first. My name is Paula Farmer. I live at 2715 Archer Avenue, and I'm usually very apolitical. Um, I, I come here today because I love na the neighborhood. The neighborhood represents what everybody in Murfreesboro wishes they had. Um, I understand houses stay on the market about four days in our neighborhood. And fortunately, we're not converting to rental property. We're converting now to young families. Um, if somebody could write the playbook, we would be the example. Um, and now I feel pretty helpless to stop what's changing. And I don't understand why we don't respect what works. Thank you all for your consideration. Thank you, Ms. Farmer. My name's Patrick Jones. I live at 2614 Morgan Road. I did send everyone an email. It was maybe later in the day. Perhaps you got it. If you didn't, let me just take a second, first of all, to thank you for listening. Second of all, to say, since Morgan Road is going to go into Archer, I think it's very important, and I hope you maybe will take the opportunity to walk in daytime drive or afternoon drive because there is a bend, there is a curve, there are two trees, there is lack of visibility. There will be a wreck there one day if you do nothing. If you exponentially increase the traffic, it'll just come sooner. And, of course, that's just one person's opinion. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Anyone else wishing to speak? Yes, sir. My name's Tony Oliver. I live at 2908 Amber. I'm in the field, so if these streets go through, it's going to be a big effect on my front yard and the flooding issues. So sometimes when I cut my grass, I have to push mow it because my zero turn spins out and tears my grass up. So there's issues in both places. Putting the streets through will be big. The drainage is an issue. So appreciate y'all take care of it for us and stop the streets. Thank you, Mr. Oliver. My name is Joanne Lamento. I live at 2711 Archer. I've lived there for over 30 years now. I moved there and moved my parents in with me. They've walked around the neighborhood from the time that they moved here with me. Um, I just last year bought myself a tricycle so that I could get around the neighborhood a little bit better with my kids, my grandkids that I'm raising now. Um, I'm looking for their neighborhood too. Not only do we have the older folks, we are having this influx of younger folks too 
who are walking their children, who are pushing the baby carriages and pushing the walkers. And it's just, I, I just cannot fathom a change to our neighborhood to make a raceway out of Archer, which I feel it's definitely going to happen if that goes through. I would, if anything has to happen, I would go with a cul-de-sac at the end of Archer and even at the end of Amber. I just don't, please don't change our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Minto. All right, you better run. <laughs> I used to. My name's Billy Pascal. I live at 2703 Morgan, the corner of Archer, the northwest corner of Archer. I have a problem with, with the traffic, like everybody said. There's a couple of things. We were uh, here for the meeting whenever they changed the property on Haynes and Memorial, made it commercial, knew that was going to happen, progress. And they talked about bringing uh, Wendellwood across Haynes up through this property behind where the high V is going to be. I'm assuming that's still going to happen at some point. That's also going to bring traffic to our subdivision because there's a stub going in the back of Judge Rogers' property that he'll eventually sell and be commercial, and that's going to bring more traffic in the backside of Archer. Uh, the drainage was a big issue. <coughs> now that they're going to build all this high V uh, market area, it's going to run more water off. They were talking about running the water to Thompson Lane. There was already a there was already an issue at Regal and crossing, uh, and, and they've been working on some of that in knowing that this is going to happen. Uh, uh, Huddleston and Steele was even involved when, they, when they, they talked about changing that to commercial property and about the, the drainage. And, and I know that's what's going to end up happening, just like Antioch when, I, when uh, Mill Creek flooded because of all the, all the asphalt and the and the and the so that's all I've got to say. Thank, Thank you, you Mr. Billy. Right. Anyone else wishing to speak? Hi there. My name is Lee Francis, and I am probably the oldest yet newest member of Palmer Heights, if that makes any sense. And um, when I was 10 years old, my parents moved here from Shreveport, Louisiana, and we resided at 2703 Archer Avenue. Sadly, last summer, my mother passed away. My father passed away many years ago. Um, but I've now had the opportunity, um, with my siblings' blessings, I purchased our family home from my brother and sister, and I have moved back to my childhood home, 2703 Archer Avenue, which I'm currently remodeling. I had to drag myself away from my brand new subway tiled shower. It was really hard to leave. <laughs> um, but I came simply to say, I've, I've been here for 45 years. My, my mother was still there all this time. The streets are tiny. And I don't think the streets can withstand what you're asking them to do if you cut through. And um, I would just ask, like you to consider a different way of handling the situation. And why it confuses me also is that I moved from Garrison Cove to Palmer Heights, and I was just doing the math in my head, and I'm not positive, but I think there are far more dwellings in Garrison <coughs> Cove than the number in this new subdivision, and there are two entrances in Garrison Cove. So I'm having a hard time understanding why we need so many in this new development. And then just to end it finally, um, I have a little puppy that I got because I'm gonna be an empty nester as I'm making this transition to my um, parents' home. And she's having to learn a new command as we're walking. This is her, she's quite adorable. It, um, her name is Bowie, but the command is, take the ditch sister because the traffic's coming and we're literally having to take the ditch on those narrow systems thank you for listening miss francis thank you my name is dick palmer uh, i live at 2722 archer uh didn't really come out here tonight prepared to say anything 
but uh, I think I owe it to my neighbors and uh, I just, just want to say that uh, as you have probably figured out by now, uh, we are opposed to opening up Archer Avenue to make it a thoroughfare or, or amber for that matter. And I think just about every development that's been uh, opened up uh, off of Memorial has, uh, I don't know any of them that have multiple entrances. I think most of them in, enter off Memorial. Some of them maybe uh, on down toward the, toward the school, enter off of uh, Regal maybe. Uh, those apartment complexes that were mentioned earlier. Uh, now, the folks who are going to live in this new development, uh, they don't know anything about all this. Uh, if they buy a house out there, they're going to figure out how to get there, you know. Uh, we go down to Regency or we can go down Memorial. They don't even know about Archer or Amber yet unless they're watching this telecast. So, uh, <laughs> Shh, don't, think, don't say anything. We well, don't get yeah. <laughs> Well, the show of force that you see here, you know what we think, okay? You guys have got the votes. Uh, we voted tonight, we could outvote you, but yours <laughs> are the votes that count, okay? So that's what we, that's all we want to say. Uh, every time somebody has a yard sale uh, down at the end of our street or Bluebell or Amber, uh, it's just like a fire drill out there. <laughs> and this is going to be, if you open those streets up, it's going to be a permanent yard sale all the way through this back like that. Uh, it's a walking neighborhood. I got to be careful backing out of my driveway. I almost hit walkers, you know. Uh, they'll sneak up on you. And the streets are not that wide. You can get two cars by. But when the uh, landscapers come in, park on the streets, it's just like that. And there's a, bu a bunch of them. So that's about all I want to say. Uh, just remember. Uh, you got a lot of votes out here. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Palmer, thank you for coming. And I close my eyes and I still, it's like I'm hearing you on the radio uh, <laughs> announcing an MTSU game. So, yes, sir. I'm Don Nalen. I live at 2807 Morgan. And I just wanted to echo what the others are saying about Archer and Amber. But um, it kind of caught my attention when the gentleman from the Planning Commission said, um, about connecting all the streets. He said, well, that's what we've always done. Well, let's not do it. We don't, there's nothing, if it doesn't have to be done, just because it's what we always did is not a good excuse. I mean, I wouldn't tell my kids that. You know? <laughs> that's the only comment I have. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak? My name is Larry Farmer. I'm a 43-year resident at 2715 Archer Avenue. I, will, I just want to put my words in about the walkers. Uh, I love walking the streets. This is a street that right now services 15 homes. And you're talking about adding a I would say half of the people would come down Archer to go to their mailboxes in the afternoons. Uh, I, uh, walking around the neighborhood, uh, my wife and I right now try to even avoid Morgan because of the flood of traffic on, on Morgan. Uh, Morgan services a lot more houses, and with this, it would obviously service a lot more. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Farmer. Anyone else wishing to speak? All right. Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. And 
Let me flip my agenda over here. We'll now consider on first reading um, ordinance 23 OZ27. We had a couple of questions. First of all, Miss Aiken, I want to tell you um, I appreciate your comments, and, and I can say all the council members who are up here, and I hope you all know this, we don't always agree, but we always try to pay attention and listen to what everyone says. And I think that's the difference. I'm not going to get on my soapbox, but the difference between local government and federal government. But a lot of times local government gets lumped in with federal government. We're in the same stores that you shop in. We drive the same roads you shop in. We go to the same schools. I mean, we live here. And so clearly we're, we do this because we love our community. We're not doing it for the paycheck. I can guarantee you that. Uh, um, so we, we do it because we all want to make our communities um, a better place to live. And as long as we feel like we're doing that, I, I think all the council members would agree we, we want to do what we, we think is best. Second of all, and, and I appreciate the comments that the developer uh, or the development team made about RS-15 and I, I discredit any time someone says something about holding us hostage about doing something else. I, I've had the opportunity to be involved in construction for a long time and I can tell you that the, pr the amount of price for RS-15 land to develop RS-15 land, the person who says that they're gonna build a 1,200 square foot house, all vinyl with front entry garage, would be broke in five minutes if they tried to do that. I mean, a good example over in Riverview, the Riverview area, we had a development come in that they did RS-15. They, it's, the lots are almost $200,000 for lots and no one's gonna end up building junk on, on a, an RS-15 lot. So. The, the, the two things that we've all talked about, drainage, stub streets. One thing I want you all to realize on, the, um, someone made the comment about race cars and here in Memorial. A, a lot of people didn't realize when emissions went away. Um, that is a great thing that we don't have to go get our cars tested anymore to be able to register our tags. The unintended consequence about that that no one really thought about is also people don't have to have their mufflers checked anymore. And so now we hear, and, and staff will tell you, I'm, it drives me crazy. I live where my house backs up to Siegel Road and we hear nonstop loud Mustangs going up and down the road. And part of that is because no one has to have their mufflers checked anymore. So I would gladly pay the $10 and have to go get my emission check to not have to hear the, the race cars all the time. Last but not least, stub streets. Um, I, I'm gonna give you all my opinion. I can name four or five instances. I always used to laugh that when in 19, or the mid 2000s, when the South Ridge tornado came through, I think I forget what year that was. I, yeah, I was sitting on planning commission and I would always um, joke that whenever we would talk about connectivity. Mr. Adelot had the TV people in the back and they would play the video of the South Ridge neighborhood where trucks couldn't get in and out. And, and I do think that is valid. But in a lot of cases, I can tell you Garrison Cove was one that I remember. Prem Springs was one that I remember. Here recently, we had a subdivision um, off of Compton Road, or excuse me, um, at the uh, Emory, at the, at the where Emory dead ends, we had a subdivision Emory and Compton Road that we said, look, we didn't think it made sense to be able to do that. So staff is always gonna recommend connecting wherever they can connect. And we appreciate that. But I do think there are absolutely instances and this piece of property, in my opinion, is a great example of a, everything's developed around this piece of property. You know, when, when Regency Park was, was developed in the 1980s, my mother and father-in-law, as a matter of fact, my mother-in-law got a ticket on Regency Park Drive the other day uh, for speeding on Regency Park Drive. So everyone make sure that you're obeying the speed limit on Regency Park Drive. The mayor's- sure She appreciates that being- Yeah, broadcast. yeah, well, <laughs> she, she, would, she called to tell me that the mayor's family gets no favors when it comes to- <laughs> So I, I, I do think there are circumstances where remnant piece of property like this, everything develops around it. And my guess is 
you typically, if this were double the site, the acreage, then yeah, it would make sense to have a bunch of connect spots connecting. In this case, I don't think it makes sense. So I'm not for Amber Archer. I, there was one more that we talked about three was, or maybe just two Amber and Amber Archer. And Archer yeah. it, it just makes sense not to do those. So Sean. All right. Uh, I talked about this at planning commission. I have the same sentiment and I will plan to make a motion. I'm going to let everybody talk first, but I, at, at planning commission, I made a motion to take Archer, take Amber off on the Amber spot, move 30, 31 and 32 over to the east a little bit. Mr. Oliver needs a driveway, but so you can't move it all the way, but move those three lots a little bit over to the right. That way it gives uh, the lady, I don't remember her name, that lives on Regency that backs up to her. It gives the ability to get that drainage out of the way a little bit, a driveway, side entry guitar, garage, then the house. So just by moving it, those three lots, what, eight foot maybe, it gives a little bit more room on that lot 30 to make some room for, to give her some privacy drainage and a driveway. Uh, and then you've got, you've still got four spots, Memorial, the road off of Regal, Banner and Tower to her entry and exit. And I think that's good, um, Mayor, that to keep Amber and um, Archer like it is, uh, it, we always talk about the quality of life, you know, for people. And I think by opening it up, it was, it's just going to be a different quality of life for people. And the neighborhood is great. Everybody that doesn't know everybody, everybody that waves at everybody. So, I mean, it just makes you, it's a fuzzy, good feeling when you're passing by and people are waving, you see families walking. You know, that, that's what quality of life to me is all about. And it's a lot of retirees, like I keep saying there, and you just don't want to disrupt their lives. Uh, and something like this will do that. So I'm in agreement that we keep it open. I mean, keep it, yeah, closed. You know, in a perfect world, if this had come back at, let's say they said we were going to do 14,000 foot lots and 77 homes, um, which would give more room to address the drainage issues. I'm still not sold on the, the drainage. I think you've done a, a decent shot at increasing that retention pond, you know, 15 to 20 percent, and that's in the northwest corner where it flows southeast to northwest. But uh, I want to say uh, the Bacons, you know, they've got an issue with drainage. The other gentleman over there by Lot 57 has got an issue with drainage. To me, it's the issue is, is the drainage in the area. And the high density, you know, it was 96, you dropped it to 85, that helps. You know, if it was 75, kind of like what we would have if it was RS-15, I could live with it. I think it's a good looking home. It's a good quality product. You would sell them. It's going to help the neighborhood values. But your your home isn't value if it's flooded out. If there's water in your front front yard in your living room and your foundation. So I think that's a major issue. The stub the, the stub out, you know, the, the gentleman, you know, that's the way we've always done it. Yeah, just because that's the way we've always done it doesn't mean we have to do it. And so I would not be for opening up, you know, Archer or Amber. I know, Sean, you're going to make a motion, but at the end of the day, I'm against this because of the flooding, to be quite honest with you. I think there's, there's issues with it. And I'm kind of like Shane. If somebody's saying, hey, somebody's going to come in here, I don't think they're going to put a, a junk property on a 15,000 square foot lot. That's just my opinion. Any other comments? Bill? Uh, I just want to appreciate everybody's comments. Everybody, uh, I told somebody today, today was uh, City Council Business Day. Uh, I got, appreciate all the emails that we got, appreciate how conscientious you were to provide videos and my photos of areas that have flooded. Uh, you know, it, it's almost impossible for us to have enough uh, knowledge, even though we've lived in this town all I mean, a lot of you, lot of you guys are friends uh, that I've, I've known you for years uh, and been in your neighborhood. Uh, so I know some of the issues. 
that we had. Ms. Bingham, you, you know, I've talked mm -hmm. on the phone, and I think the simple answer is um, I'm going to vote with my colleagues. I don't believe that Archer and Am Amber need to be opened. Um, I just want to impress, you know, Matthew, you might speak a little bit to the difference between a PRD and if we bulk zone this, what kind of oversight would we have if we left the zoning as it is and didn't approve this and we just did the bulk zoning, what kind of oversight as far as planning, review, and stuff like that? But could you speak a little bit to that so we might inform us all a little bit? Yes, sir, Mr. Shacklett, I'd be glad to. And uh, to Mayor McFarland, first of all, I wanted to apologize because at the Planning Commission public hearing, um, there were concerns about speeding on Regency Park Drive, so I called the police department and asked them to <laughs> look into it. You should apologize to his mother-in-law, I think. <laughs> but I was doing my civic duty as a public servant, so. Uh, um, Thank, thanks, Matthew. I mean, we're 24 in, 24 years in, so we're all stuck together with. <laughs> so. um, Mr. Shacklett. Um, yeah, to, to just kind of um, elaborate on the difference between traditional bulk zoning of RS-15 and um, planned development zoning. Um, planned development zoning, uh, when people ask me what it is, I say it's planned specific zoning. So as opposed to the applicants being to develop if they, or getting to develop if they meet the minimum requirements of our zoning ordinance, um, which they would be able to do under traditional bulk zoning um, you know, and certainly there are, uh, our regulations don't have a minimum home size, um, uh, but as Mayor McFarland mentioned, there are market forces at play that, that, that come into play as far as what would be profitable for some, someone to develop. But there would be no minimum lot size. The, um, the uh, developer would have to uh, develop the lots with a minimum 15,000 square foot uh, lot size, meet the setbacks. Of that uh, of the RS15 zoning district, um, there would be no requirements for any amenity areas other than just a mail kiosk. Um, there would be um, uh, uh, no requirement for it to come to city council. The approval process for a um, for it would be a subdivision plat submittal to the uh, to the planning commission for review and approval, and it's a it's about meeting. Um, minimum standards and the you know, planning commission would review it for meeting minimum standards and so the planning commission would determine how to apply our our um, street extension policies um, uh, via that subdivision plat review process um, and so i've heard it said I, I, I think the estimate is about 75 lots that could be developed under the existing rs15 zoning but we do not have a um, an rs15 conceptual layout to to validate that, that's just an estimate. Uh, with the planned development zoning, rather than what the minimum standards are in our um, in our zoning ordinance and in our subdivision regulations, um, it's the minimum standards that are put forth in the pattern book, which uh, is a land use entitlement that goes first to planning commission and then to city council. And so there are um, commitments that are made via the planned development process that, um, uh, Kind of go above and beyond what would be required in our in our traditional bulk zoning districts. So, when a an hydrology study is done, how do we guarantee that in a PRD or whatever is being developed that that adequately handles the water that's on their property? How, how is? Uh, I think I think whether it's a PRD or whether it's RS15. Um, our engineering department is going to review the drainage plan um, to make sure that there is no additional runoff going on to the neighboring properties. So it, it'll have to pass the same scrutiny, whether it's 85 lots or 75 lots, and meet the same standards, whether it's 85 lots or 75 lots. Um, one, one thing that I did want to mention with, um, if you did choose not to, um, not to extend uh, uh, several of the streets, our subdivision regulations do require that they terminate properly in a cul-de-sac so, um, so that our service delivery vehicles and other motorists can safely turn around. Yes, sir. 
Is that adequate at Sir, uh, Amber and Archer to turn around? Is 22 feet, is that what we said? Sure, 22 feet wide. 22 feet wide? No, sir, they, they would have to dedicate right of way on their property on in their the bulb property. of a cul-de-sac. Um, or, uh, you know, I, I don't know if a hammerhead would be acceptable. That might be a little bit less intrusive to their development plan. Uh, but we would have to work with them on modifying their plan to provide a, a proper turnaround at the, uh, at the end of any stub streets that are not extended into the property. The, the people on Archer, right, that would be more for the, the new development. I mean, the people on Archer, we're picking up their trash and providing police service now with no cul-de-sac there. So uh, that, nothing would change for Archer, would it? Uh, no, the policy is, is that if it's not extended, that that street be terminated in a cul-de-sac. Okay. Is the developer willing to so round to you? Is the developer <laughs> Wait, so I'm confused, Matthew. Um, if Archer is the way it is right now because there was the anticipation that that road would be extended, but if, if the cul-de-sac goes on to lots 54 and 57, I think that's the, the or is that, I can't, 36 and 57 maybe? I, I can't see what those those lots are. 36 and 57. So there would be a cul-de-sac there, correct? Yes, sir. So you're saying that, that, we, that there would have to be a cul-de-sac built on, on the Archer as well? Yeah, a any street that doesn't extend into this development would have to properly terminate in the cul-de-sac or um, according to our subdivision regulations. Okay. And is that going who who does that who builds that uh the developer would have to properly terminate the that street so it would be on his property uh and right of way dedicated the bowl with the cul-de-sac would okay, be right of way what, dedicated on I his see what property you're saying. so so it would this would not be the, the the onus would not go on the homeowners on archer it that hammerhead would have to go on to this new development onto property. the Brightland Homes property, okay. yes, sir. Yeah, that makes much more sense. Well, <laughs> so, well, I mean, just we're, we're uh, changing the design. I mean, so we've got to. I mean, I, we've got to get somebody's approval. <laughs> That's they're willing to. Yeah, I think I think they'll need to speak to how that impacts their development well, plan. I don't know if they've if I, they've considered that if they've if they perhaps anticipated this after the discussion at the planning commission um, i mean i watched the entire planning commission meeting and and i saw that it was a four to three vote because most everyone was giving pause to the connection so i would assume any engineer would have said and anticipated that could be an issue have, so have y'all made plans to if those stub streets were not extended what that would a redesign on on coming forward is that yes we have considered that or no we haven't considered it <laughs> okay well so I mean I, w I would say this I would think that as a council if we did decide to defer. pass this on first reading deleting all those that we would want to see a redesign of those streets no longer being extended before it came to us on second reading is that sound right bill well either that or defer it i mean you, you, the issue is you're going to either defer it or or I, I don't know if we're ready to pass on first reading or not i, I think those are the two options um yeah. either approving it on a first reading i mean if you, if you if you wish to approve it on first reading minus one or two or three of the connections how many ever um i think that well, we would not bring back the item for second and final reading until we had a revised pattern book we'd have to work with the applicant on that on that design before second and final reading yeah that's okay that's yeah. fine we're not asking you guys to pull out and redesign now but i i if it was what, se yeah if it was 75 homes without the stub streets and more issues more common areas for storm water in the southeast southwest i think that would address my issues if i can comment on that i think that if we could get it approved 
as it stands as far as the lot quantity and go ahead and evaluate those cul-de-sacs because we think we'll probably end up losing another lot as a result of the cul-de-sacs. We may end up getting closer to the 75 number anyways. We would have to just evaluate that. Um, the developer, obviously, we've been whittling this thing down. As far as Austin's concern, Mr. Maxwell's concern, as far as drainage, as Matthew mentioned, if it's 75 homes or 85 homes, it's got to perform. It doesn't really change the characteristics. We got to make sure it performs no matter if it was 15 homes, it'd have to perform. So that requirement is not really relevant to the amount of units, it's, it's relevant to the quality of the engineering. So we would like to keep the unit count the home count if we can with approval and then we would basically get it redesigned where the cul-de-sacs would come in and evaluate that before we have the second reading for sure yeah the only thing i would say to the residents and, and I, I used to live on twin feather which was a very comparable ditch line subdivision things have changed so much since things were developed in the 70s and 80s you know now you have to keep all of your your on-site water on your property for 24 hours that's why for example archer there's no retention ponds anywhere in in regency park or regal or but you'll see newer subdivisions that now all have retention and detention ponds that that water has to be kept on the property and, I mean, and you're also going to see now no ditch line section streets because we can't have sidewalks but more importantly speaking from experience everyone mows their yard and next thing you know the pipes up underneath your driveways get clogged up or silted up and then that's what the city's been working on fixing for the last several months because they just don't get maintained and and you have to rely on that drainage structure where now we rely on curb and gutter and everything goes into your storm sewer so we're very aware and, and spend you know, you'll, you'll look on your water and sewer bill and you'll see a stormwater fee that you pay every month. That stormwater fee is how that we pay for going into older subdivisions and fixing the drainage structures. Lee Avenue is a great example that we did significant work on Lee Avenue in, in fixing those drainage structures. So, um, council members, do y'all have any? I just want to clarify one thing in my mind. So right now is RS-15. And if it stays RS-15, that means that as a council, you know, we have no say-so right. on things. But if we change it to plan development, uh, we can guide things as far as the landscape and setbacks and number of lots. We have control over that, right? Correct. And also, um, it applies if someone else buys the land. This uh, <coughs> new zoning, it stays with the property and not the new developer, right? That's right. Gotcha. All right, I, I think the benefits of the plan development over the bulk zoning uh, are, are majorly beneficial here uh, to keep the property values high on the adjacent properties. You, I mean, I'm sure they're going to build a nice product if it was straight zoning, but there's no way to guarantee they're going to do things that would upkeep it. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and make the motion, deleting Archer, deleting Amber, uh, and approving everything else. I second. All right, we have a motion and a second. So now are, are we going to ask them to bring it back for yeah. second reading? Okay. Uh, and uh, Matthew, I, I think just so the council members were all on the same page, this is a amending what's on being a, uh, presented, deleting those stub streets, and that this will not come back to us until the engineering has been readjusted and then we we can we can look at that yes sir i think we'll probably need to sit down with mr mcguire and mr roundtree and and evaluate their the options for them to terminate those two streets and then um, when we agree on a design we'll bring it back to you for your consideration on second reading okay all right we have a motion a second Ms. brown please call the roll miss averwater aye miss gills harris aye mr maxwell no vice mayor shacklett aye mr wright aye mayor mcfarland aye all right, we'll now move to rezoning property along Veterans Parkway. And let's give a couple minutes, let the, no, you guys, y'all, we can clear the, clear out. I don't, y'all are welcome to stay and see how the rest of local government works, but. It's <laughs> lying out here when you say it that. <laughs>
folks, if if y'all will, let's. We, we, uh, yeah, our meeting's still going, so let's quickly go out. We still have other things we gotta we gotta get done. <laughs> They don't realize our meeting just started. Here's your big boy voice. The teacher will rest of the meeting will last exactly 12 minutes. Don't tempt me with a good thing. All right, we're gonna move. That shows up. All right, we're gonna move to item eight. This is rezoning property along Veterans Parkway. Thank you, Mayor McFarland. Um, our next public hearing tonight is for the rezoning of approximately 16.46 acres located along the east side of Veterans Parkway. Uh, it's currently zoned commercial highway. It's a large, deep, property zone commercial highway um, kind of custom made for a big box and we don't see a whole lot of big boxes anymore so um, so the applicant is proposing to rezone it to planned commercial district and planned residential district um, a little bit more specifically about the location uh, it's just north of the intersection of Veterans Parkway and Franklin Road um, and it's di directly to the north of the uh, Kroger at that intersection. Um, there are a couple of additional commercial uses directly in front of the subject property, a, a veterinary clinic and a dental office. And there was a commercial and townhome development approved across Veterans Parkway um, earlier this year. To the north of the subject property is zoned CF commercial fringe and the Board of Zoning Appeals very recently approved a uh, special use permit for a self storage facility on that property. To the north of um, that property is the Cloister subdivision, which is zoned PRD, single family residential uh, lots directly um, to the north there. And also overall Creek and its floodway are along the Eastern property line and uh, county subdivision across overall Creek. The applicants are requesting um, PCD and PRD zoning. Um, there it will be one commercial out parcel there and a commercial parcel here with several commercial buildings and they're um, setting the architecture and the layout and um, uh, of those commercial buildings and setting forth the uses that are proposed. Um, to the rear of those commercial buildings will be an 80 unit townhome development. Uh, that townhome development will be um, developed uh, as part of a horizontal property regime so that those units can be sold individually. Uh, one of the things that we um, worked hard, um, specifically Mr. McKnight and Ms. Rush, worked hard with the developer on this was to create a strong interaction between the residential component of this development and the commercial component of this development. Um, there are pedestrian promenades, I uh, sound very fancy when I say that, pedestrian promenades that go between the townhomes and the commercial portion of the development to create a very walkable community. Um, to create um, kind of a synergy between those two uses um, so that it feels like a mixed-use community. Um, the uh, future land use map that was adopted shows the front portion of this property where the commercial is located as neighborhood commercial. The proposed PCD zoning is consistent with the future land use map in that regard. The rear portion where the townhomes are proposed to be located is shown as auto urban residential. And the auto urban residential land use character um, does require, um, uh, if they're gonna be townhomes, it must be in an area or must be in a development that also has single family detached homes. This particular development, we've been discussing uh, this development with the applicant for um, about three years now. And so uh, staff felt this was a, um, this was an appropriate opportunity to deviate from the future land use map just because of the history uh, on this particular property. Um, the applicant originally, I think in October of 2020, requested a uh, purely a townhome development. And uh, staff believes that the improvements that he has made, creating that synergy between the commercial and the residential and committing to the quality that he's committing to with the commercial development um, has, uh, uh, makes up for the fact that there are no single family detached homes 
um, in this development. The Planning Commission conducted a public hearing on this request on July the 12th and voted to recommend its approval at that meeting. Uh, Mr. Brian Grover with SEC has a presentation to go over the specifics of this development. And I'll be happy to answer any questions before or after our public hearing tonight. Mayor McFarland and members of the council, thank you for giving us the opportunity tonight to present our project. Uh, I'm Brian Grover from SEC, here with Matt Taylor from SEC as well and Joey Menji of Cornerstone Development. Uh, as stated, the project is located on the west side of town, just east of Veterans Parkway and north of 96. Closer look, uh, Kroger exists just south of the site with a physical training site um, or membership between this <coughs> proposed site and Veterans Parkway, along with a dental office and a veterinary office. Current zoning for the site is commercial highway. Surrounding zoning for this area is very similar, commercial fringe. Um, this corridor is definitely developing towards more of a commercial aspect uh, along Veterans Parkway and with the uh, more recent developments going around along 96. Some looks into the site. This is a view of the proposed entrance along Veterans Boulevard looking east into the site. This is a view from the um, southeast corner of the site looking west. Some of the familiar aspects around the site, uh, Kroger, the veterinary clinic, and then along with the dental office and the fitness slash training uh, facility along Veterans Parkway. This rezoning is requesting two aspects with this development, a PCD and a PRD. The total land area is roughly about 16 and a half acres with uh, just over 12 acres being dedicated to the PRD and roughly 3.7 being dedicated to the PCD uh, with the remainder being dedicated to right away. Uh, the PRD is proposing approximately 80 units with the PCD proposing approximately 23,500 square feet of commercial floor area. Um, access to the site, which will be utilized by both portions of this development, will be primarily off Veterans Parkway. There's an existing light along the access road towards Kroger today existing. Um, and the proposed development is proposing a connection to Veterans Parkway via three lanes, a dedicated left and right and an ingress lane as well. All roads within the PRD portion of this development are proposed to be private um, and have access to the shared access drives that exist um, through the proposed development as well as um, the site will be utilizing the access drive in existence behind the current commercial between this development and Veterans Parkway. Uh, working with staff, we wanted to make sure that all the proposed roads and horizontal alignment within the site uh, met safety standards for fire trucks. Um, as these are private roads, we want to make sure that we were still following the standards from the city in order to maintain that level of um, standard. Looking closer into the PRD, the project, as I said, it, it, it's sitting on the 12 acres on the eastern side of this development. It has 80 units for approximately 6.6 .6 units an acre. It will be townhomes on a horizontal property regime. The, uh, one of the main goals, or I can see the three aspects of the design that was utilized in this design uh, was the idea to make it a, a walkable community um, as as well as one that was um, more of an urban aesthetic to it, I guess you could say. And the three design uh, aspects that were utilized for this is the townhomes were brought forward, the front setbacks being reduced to put the homes closer to the street to allow the, the homes to 
um, interact with the streetscape. In doing so, the homes are then would then be alley loaded with rear entry garages at, through the alleys. Uh, another aspect was the idea of traffic control through the development and the with the implementation of traffic calming, such as the side street parking that's throughout this site. Uh, along the private roads inside the PRD, there is a significant amount of on-street parking to not only help slow traffic down, but to also provide uh, excess parking for the entire development as a whole, um, as well as the um, design aspect of making a walkable community. There are sidewalks along all the private roads. The pedestrian corridors going through the site really help connect the PRD to the PCD and are a definitive aspect of this uh, project's design. Some of the standards throughout the site, it will be governed by an HOA and all members are required to be a part of that. Utilities will be underground um, and um, the site will conform to the Murfreesboro landscape standards. The architecture within the site, the buildings um, per the PRD will not exceed 35 feet in height. They'll be around 1,350 square feet. All homes will be two-story homes with a minimum of three bedrooms, and all homes will be alley loaded. All homes will have a one or two car rear entry garage access through the alley. Materials for the architecture for these homes, the front facade will primarily or will be all masonry product <coughs> with the sides and rear consisting of masonry as well as a cementous fiber board. Here's an example of that architecture. Uh, we can start to see how the, the homes really start to address the street, the masonry in the front. Here's a rear view of the townhomes uh, as seen from the alleyway with the rear loaded garages. Around the entire home, we will have that 18 inch water table, as you can see in here, and an elevation of the side, once again, maintaining that higher level of quality when it comes to materials for the townhomes. <coughs> Some of the amenities that we provided throughout this site and development standards uh, an entry sign at the beginning of the development. Um, as discussed before, one of the most important aspects of this when it comes to the walkability is the pedestrian promenade proposed in this site. You can see that here marked in red as it connects the PRD and the PCD. And some example photos below of what potentially that could look like. Not only is the site walkable and has that strong connection to the PCD, but also has a strong amenity package for the residents themselves. Uh, this includes a pavilion, playground, pet park, and a uh, campfire or fire pit area as well. Um, some more images below. The PCD on the west side, um, as stated before, it's approximately 3.7 acres. There are two lots. Uh, a key point of this PCD is it is a continuation of the pedestrian promenade into the site. You can see that p promenade actually coming through the parking lot, um, creating that experience coming into this commercial area. Some of the prohibited uses, um, this is gonna follow the commercial fringe. Land use is the, is the idea for this development. Um, some prohibited uses such as beer stores, liquor, or vape shops um, would not be permitted within this development. And the plan book spells out these um, as well to make sure that this is clear is the intention for the development. Uh, lot two, which consists of the four buildings, would not have any drive-throughs permitted. This is to maintain that pedestrian level of connection to the buildings and walkability. The architecture for the PCD portion of this, the buildings will not exceed 42 feet in height. They will all be one story. They have well-defined entrances the primary materials will be masonry and such as brick, cast stone, and synthetic stone as well. And all buildings will comply with the Murfreesboro design guideline standards. Some example imagery of what this will look like. Here's an aerial view looking 
from the proposed access road off of Veterans into the site. You can see the commercial PCD in the front with the elevated storefronts that begin to really address the street. Um, as well as you can also start to see in the back this pedestrian promenade and its um, connectivity from the PRD portion to the PCD. As Matthew stated, connectivity was an important factor in this, and not just having the ability for people to walk from one to the next, but also visually how do these two developments work together. Rather than build a typical, I guess you say, wall them off from each other just to try and block them, we wanted to integrate a design style that would seamlessly transition one from the next while still visually delineating one development from the other. This was achieved by utilizing the same style parallel parking that's used on the private roads on this portion of the PCD parking, emulating that street front um, streetscape within the, the PRD. At a pedestrian level, here's a close-up of one of these stores, storefronts. You can see that the pedestrian scale for these is um, welcoming and there's several other aspects such as planters, street trees um, that will help create that urban feel within this commercial area. This is a view from the other side of the development uh, closer to the Kroger um, store and once again this is that elevated storefronts with the um, different elevated um, characteristics such as the planters and the um, vegetation around the site. Looking into the, the looking west into the backside of the PCD, several plazas and seating areas are were designed and made available to patrons for the site. Uh, ample landscaping was provided to help soften this area to make sure um, it was um, in a soft space and an enjoyable space for pedestrians to go and enjoy themselves. Here's an image of where one of those promenades actually comes and terminates. Here you can see the difference in the, uh, the ground plan material to help delineate spaces as well as some of those other elements <coughs> such as the planters and landscape beds along the buildings. Um, this is just that strong corridor connection to the PRD that then radiates into the PCD. Some of, the, uh, some of the open space characteristics and numbers for the PCD area, it is pro um, proposed to have approximately over half an acre of open space with about 6,000 square feet of formal open space, which equates to um, 0.138 acres of formal open space. Several seating areas are proposed within this for individuals to enjoy, um, as well as ample, landsca ample landscaping um, and that strong connection once again to the pedestrian corridor. Some of the site elements that could possibly be seen in this site um, are shown here, such as the, the planters and the cafe style seating, uh, along with other options for se seating, such as seating walls found throughout the site. Um, overall, this site has a strong connection both to the PCD and PRD portion. Uh, it follows similar patterns that we've seen with the commercial being developed along veterans, followed by more residential um, behind those commercial components. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them now or after the hearing. Any questions? No. All right, we need to open, uh, thank you. We need to open the public hearing. Uh, anyone wishing to speak for or against the rezoning of the 16.46 acres, please come to the podium. All right, seeing none, we'll close the public hearing and we'll now consider on first reading ordinance 23OZ28. So moved. Second. Motion is second. Please call the roll. Ms. Averwater? Aye. Ms. Gales Harris? Aye. Mr. Maxwell? Aye. Vice Mayor Shacklett? Aye. Mr. Wright? Aye. Mayor McFarland? Aye. All right, we'll move to item nine rezoning property along East Vine Street. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Our final public hearing tonight is for property located along the south side of East Vine Street. There we go. It is in the block in between Highland and University. <clears throat> it's directly adjacent to the uh, west of the Villas on Vine 
development that Mr. Brian Burns developed a couple of years ago. And it's a similar size property, and, um, but it's a slightly smaller, and the applicant is proposing five uh, single-family attached uh, dwelling units on the subject property. Mr. Burns' development to the east has uh, six dwelling units on it. Property is currently zoned RS8, which is single-family residential with a minimum lot size of 8,000 square feet. It's also located in the City Core Overlay District. Uh, staff worked with the applicant to create a different look for the building on the front that contains two units. The building in the rear contains three units, and it's more of a traditional townhome-style look. But the building on the front uh, was specifically designed to resemble more of a large single-family manor home, and I think that's probably the impetus for the name of the development, East, East Vine Manor. Um, I won't get into too much of the, um, of the specifics of the, uh, of the development, because uh, Mr. Grover will go into that. Um, the future land use map, the Murfreesboro 2035 Comprehensive Plan recommends that it develop as uh, mixed form housing. Uh, mixed form housing is defined as, uh, it could be single family uh, or it could be uh, developments, uh, single family attached developments in two, three or four unit buildings. And so this development is five units with a two unit building and a three unit building. Uh, the, uh, the proposed request is consistent with the Murfreesboro 2035 plan recommendation of mixed form housing. And uh, the applicant worked uh, closely with staff to achieve that look of the, uh, of the uh, large single family home along the front. Um, with that being said, the uh, Planning Commission voted on uh, July the 12th to recommend the approval of this uh, rezoning request from RS8 and CCO to PRD and CCO. Be happy to answer any questions before or after the public hearing. And Mr. Grover has a uh, brief presentation that he would uh, like to share with you. Thank you, Matthew. Once again, I'm Brian Grover from SEC. I'm here with Matt Taylor from SEC as well as Barry Daniel from the 520 Vine Street LLC. As stated, the site is about five blocks just east of um, the square in Murfreesboro. Located here, as you see, the lot currently as it sits is, a, is vacant uh, with East Vine Street on the north side and South Highland Street on the west. Current zoning for this site is RS8. Uh, the South Highland Avenue and East Vine Street parcel that's on that intersection is also zoned RS8. The PRD to the east um, actually mirrors and reflects a lot of these same components within this plan. And the remaining adjacent parcels are all zoned RM. The future land use plan does have this area characterized as a mixed form housing, which is simply a mix of detached and attached housing that all share an architectural characteristic and the um, design style of na neighborhood kind of design. So it's the idea is porches, stoops, dorm dormers, so on and so forth to create a cons consistent architectural appeal through this area, um, which also aligns with the CCO overlay guidelines as well. Looking into the site uh, from East Vine Street, you can see um, all the way to the, pretty much the back of the site. The reverse of that uh, view shed from here is on the south side of the site looking towards East Vine Street. This is the current road conditions um, looking east on East Vine. Here's a photo of that PRD development just to the east of this. Uh, as I said before, there's a lot of characteristics that are mirrored and reflected within the proposed PRD um, we have here today. This is an image of the rear units. As you can see, as compared to the ones along East Vine Street, which are rear loaded, the rear units are front loaded, thus uh, keeping all of the parking in the center of the lot, um, which is very similar to the design aspect of the proposed PRD here. Um, one of the differences is we only have five units, two of them in the front, three in the rear. This site's just over half an acre at 0.64 acres uh, for roughly a density of 7.81 units. It would be townhomes on a horizontal property regime. Uh, 
standard development uh, practices would be included with this in the terms of underground utilities. Members would be part of the HOA and include a uh, buffer on the western and southern portion of the site to help mitigate impact to the single family detached homes. Um, two of the key points of this design is the strong delineation between private and shared spaces. Uh, you can see that here with the private access drive, but the private drives per unit are actually proposed to have pavers on them. Two reasons, one to help delineate what is the private realm, what is the public, and also provide an opportunity for stormwater management and the um, to the use of permeable pavers. The site um, does provide a strong amenity package. Um, there is a sufficient parking on site, one in the garage, two in the driveway, as well as two guest spaces uh, over here near the proposed amenity ki mail kiosk location. The townhomes uh, will be or not to exceed 35 feet. They're, they will be at a minimum 2,000 square feet, two-story homes, uh, three-bedroom minimum, and um, the elevations will all consist of brickstone and fiber cement board. Here's an example of those elevations. Here you can see the front unit, um, and as part of the CCO overlay, the goal of this product is to create the look of a single-family home. Here's the rear view of that building. As you can see, um, the garages are in the back of this one for the rear loaded front portion along East Vine Street. This is the three unit building in the back with the front loaded garages and the rear of the unit here. Part of the CCO district requires uh, another type of open space. It is private, for, uh, private open space and that is required to be supplied per unit. So one of the options to do that is back patios or second story balconies as well. Access would just be off East Vine Street in the form of a shared access drive. The formal open space is located in the southwest corner of the site. Uh, it will be providing a pavilion fireplace um, it's a pretty strong amenity package for five units, um, I would say. Uh, you can see here located in these blue areas are the private open space, as well as uh, delineated here in this red line a proposed fence to help screen this development um, from the neighbors. Uh, and that fence does actually go along the west, south, and a little bit up the east side to help make that back common area a little more private for the residents. If you guys have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer now or after the hearing. Any questions? All right. Seeing none, we'll open the public hearing. Anyone wishing to speak for or against, uh, please come to the podium. All right. Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. We'll now consider on first reading ordinance 23 OZ 29. So move approval. Second. Motion is second. Ms. Brown, please call the roll. Ms. Averwater? Aye. Ms. Gales Harris? Aye. Mr. Maxwell? Aye. Vice Mayor Shacklett? Aye. Mayor McFarland? Aye. All right, we'll move to uh, sewer allocation variance. This is for Old Fort Parkway Dutch <coughs> Brothers Coffee. Mr. Barbie? Good afternoon, Mayor and members of the City Council. Uh, sewer allocation variance before you this afternoon is for a Dutch Brothers Coffee. Uh, that is pro proposed to go at the intersection of the Old Fort Parkway Furnish Road and Marketplace. Um, you may recognize it as an abandoned bank building that's, that's been there for several years. Um, according to the information that we've received, uh, they're currently allowed two single family units of uh, sewer capacity and they will need 6.5 additional units of capacity um, in order to meet what they need. Our Water Resources Department has reviewed the data and has confirmed that the additional capacity is available. Uh, staff has reviewed, has reviewed the information that's been presented and values the uh, opportunity for tax revenue and job creation as being greater than uh, the excess sewer capacity that's needed. I'm available if you have any questions. Any questions for Mr. Barbie? I just have a comment. Uh, I voted no on this project yesterday at planning, not because the 
I'm against Dutch Brothers or anything, but I just think it's a terrible location for a coffee shop. You don't like coffee. I don't ever drink coffee, yeah, but it's not drink yeah. coffee. <laughs> it's very weird. I'm trying to visualize. Right across from Target, that little entrance right over across Target. Like you coming off of Old Fort, you turn to the right, you go to the hotel, Double Tree. Yeah. Yes, it's the old bank. It was a bank yeah. for a long time. Yeah. Right beside I, uh, Garden Plaza Hotel. Yeah. I almost got hit there. I, Mr. I did get hit there. Well, <laughs> I was coming I was coming from um, Home Depot and you know the street when the light turns you just keep straight. Yeah, but I was keeping straight and somebody that was coming like from Walmart area didn't mm -hmm. stop at the stop sign. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to see the congestion there. That, so Mr. Tucker I want to ask a quick question before we get too far. Um, this intersection Dear Murfreesboro on Instagram has a has a field day with this intersection, but taking that aside. As a what? As field a day. field day. They hate this intersection. Oh, yeah. oh. Um, can we discuss the project or are we just discussing the sewer the variance? You're just dis sorry. You're just discussing the sewer variance. So for example, though if but if it's a project that we didn't want to give that variance based on other factors, how, how do we address that? Ultimately, we could I, just say, look, I, we, don't want to give the, we don't want to give the variance, we right? don't want, You don't want to give the okay. variance, yeah. Okay. But that, for example, a site plan would not come to the council, correct? I don't recall ever seeing okay. this one come before the council. Okay. The, um, just as, a, uh, as some additional background, the site plan did go before the Planning Commission yesterday and was approved subject to um, the sewer variance. That was one of the conditions of approval. Okay. And Mr. Brick Murphy representing uh, the developers here, if you have any questions for him. Okay. Now, second note. I have talked to Chris Griffith about the study of cutting that intersection off. What are you trying to say? I'm just making sure all the cards are on the table. I'm trying to figure out how. Yeah. So the. I guess the men's warehouse and the Panera Bread is right behind it. Right across from it. If you're facing the building, it's kind of to the left. Yeah. Facing the front of the building. I think it's the old Southern Community Bank. It's yeah, been it several different. It's been Smart Bank. Yeah, it's yeah. been probably. Uh, it's been a lot of banks over the last many years. I think every bank who buys that location quickly finds out that's not a great location to get Real people in and, in and out of there. So. And there were some modifications made to the site plan before the Planning Commission approved it yesterday. It was uh, the southernmost access onto Marketplace was made a right-in only, and the access onto the frontage road was modified to allow a left out to help traffic gravitate to the, to the east to the Mall Circle Drive traffic light. Mr. Tucker, when we passed our sewer ordinance, part of the reason the council did that was to be able to have discussions on when and where we would give variances. That's correct, yes. I think it's fair to, if the council deems where we're gonna give that capacity, the, the thing that is tough with this situation, we don't have as a council any other information. Would it be possible to get that other information for us to consider at our next, our next meeting and I mean, I think when we have our member of the planning, two members of the planning commission and one that w we rely on those boards and commissions to give feedback to the council, it would be advantageous to us to be able to get that information as we're approving a variance. Happy to get any information that you need, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, what, uh, what specific information? I think it'd be good to see the project and the site plan, you know, sure. just yeah. to understand. If it would be helpful. I've 
pulled up the ordinance if if people would like to hear what council may consider in about in granting a variance okay yeah sure it says um, this so there is the process that um, where you there are several factors where you're just looking at the system in general um, capacity for for uh, a, a particular um, when you're faced with a particular request for a variance. Um, and then it says the city council may authorize an additional daily wastewater generation allowance to a project provided the technical factors listed in the section I was just referencing, either individually or collectively, do not militate against the approval of the requested allowance so that they don't say you shouldn't vote or uh, grant the allowance that sufficient sewer capacity exists within the system and within basin or sub basin in which the project is located. The proposed project is, in the opinion of the City Council, consistent with the City's adopted land use plans and policies concerning growth and development, and the additional daily wastewater generation allowance granted by the City is not greater than 10% of the total available ca capacity of the basin or sub basin in which the project is located. Provided the application satisfies those four prior requirements, the City Council, in deciding whether to authorize an additional allowance, may consider any other factor identified at the Council's deliberations related to whether a particular application promotes or undermines public health or safety or the general welfare of the City and its residents. Would safety in this matter with a dangerous intersection and a high-use traffic area come into play? I, I think that would fall within the category of safety. And the, uh, the site plan was included in the agenda materials. This is a little bit of a dated site. This was what was available at the time the agenda was published last week or, or earlier this week. Uh, at Planning Commission, this drive here was made right in only. So traffic cannot exit on the marketplace at that location. Matthew, I don't mean to stop sure. you, but I, I would, I'm speaking as me, I would rather defer this yeah. and let us get the information where we can ask you questions and not have to try to understand it and form an opinion in a minute yes sir uh, if, if you're if if y'all are okay with that yeah especially if it, if we think that there's a an issue so it, that that would be i think better for all of us if, if there's a motion to defer motion to defer second all right motion a second Ms. brown please call the roll Ms. Averwater? Aye. Ms. Gills Harris? Aye. Mr. Maxwell? Aye. Vice Mayor Shacklett? Aye. Mr. Wright? Aye. Mayor McFarland? Aye. All right, we'll move to resolution 23R25, school budget amendment. Director Duke? Good evening. Uh, first of all, thank you, Mayor, for your words about the school zone. We appreciate that. And Thank you, Ms. Harris, as well, for your prayer for the kids tonight. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm presenting a resolution for your approval to recognize new revenues that have been awarded to the city schools. These new revenue sources were all approved on the July 25th uh, school board meeting. In our general purpose funds, we have obtained a $51,500 grant from the United Way. In addition, our final state funding allocation for the year generated an additional $300,000 above what was projected in our original budget. In our federal projects fund, we have obtained a three-year $1.1 million grant to assist with behavior and mental health supports, as well as a $50,000 grant focused on supporting the academic needs of our students with disabilities. Finally, our school nutrition department has been awarded a $100,000 grant to purchase foods from local producers and small businesses, and I'm happy to answer any questions the council may have. If no questions. Go ahead. If no questions, I move for approval. Second. Motion to second. Please call the roll. Ms. Averwater? Aye. Ms. Gills Harris? Aye. Mr. Maxwell? Aye. Vice Mayor Shacklett? Aye. Mr. Wright? Aye. Mayor McFarland? Dr. Duke, just Aye. one moment. Uh, just wanted to invite the council, and I think you would too, about to the ribbon cutting. Yes, Wednesday night, our ribbon cutting for the new Case and Lane Pre-K building. We have students there. It's wonderful having little students uh, in the building. So we invite you all to come out and see the building that you so graciously helped us obtain. When is that again? I'm sorry. It's Wednesday afternoon, I believe, 4 at 430. I'll, uh, 415 Mr. and 430 is the ribbon cutting. Yes. I'm sorry. Wednesday. Okay. Thank I send my proxy. I'm out of town. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay. That was a great collaboration between city staff and the uh, 
city schools staff to be able to make this come to fruition and it's a think, lot of hard work with both staffs uh, in a short amount of time but uh, we got it done and we can be real proud of all right uh, we'll move to Brinkley Road Phase 1 change order. I was trying to skip over a change order, Chris. <laughs> Hard to uh, follow up on Trey. He's always getting a lot of money, and I'm always spending a lot of money. So, <laughs> uh, Do have the final change order for uh, the Brinkley Road project. Uh, that project's been successfully completed, and this basically just do, does the accounting to, uh, to, to close out the project. Uh, the construction costs with this change order did increase. Um, from three hundred eighty three million eight hundred fifty nine thousand four hundred fifty seven dollars to four million seventy five thousand eight hundred thirty five dollars, which is the two hundred sixteen thousand three hundred seventy eight dollar change order. Uh, we had reallocated some funds uh, a few uh, or a month or so ago at a at a council meeting. Is what this is is for. With that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Mr. Griffith? So moved. Second. Motion second. Please call the roll. Ms. Averwater? Aye. Ms. Gels Harris? Aye. Mr. Maxwell? Aye. Vice Mayor Shocklet? Aye. Mr. Wright? Aye. Mayor McFarland? Aye. All right, we'll move to Medical Center Phase 1 construction. Uh, yes, sir. This is the, uh, the the design for Phase 1 has been completed of Medical Center Parkway. If you remember, this is from I-24 to Thompson Lane. Um, staff is recommending utilizing the city's existing annual construction contracts for the completion of this work. Uh, the use of the annual contracts will allow city staff to more closely direct the contractor's work and to minimize traffic disruptions and control the, the pace of the work more efficiently. Our engineer's estimate was roughly $8.5 million for this work. Uh, staff estimates that using the annual contract pricing, the construction estimate will be about a little over $7 million. Uh, this project is, uh, is funded by the FY21 and 22 CIP budgets. With that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. No questions, so moved. Second. Motion second, please call the roll. Ms. Averwater? Aye. Ms. Gales Harris? Aye. Mr. Maxwell? Aye. Vice Mayor Shacklett? Aye. Mr. Wright? Aye. Mayor McFarland? All right. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Hey, and thank you for that Brinkley Road project. I know that's been a long time coming, but getting that finaled out has been beneficial for that west side of town. All right, we'll move to the purchase of two new uh, trucks. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, the fire department has a desire to purchase two, uh, two new 2023 uh, Ford F-150 tr uh, trucks bought through the State of Tennessee vehicle contract with the Ford of Murfreesboro here in town. Uh, the vehicles will be used for our frontline response. Uh, the trucks are uh, 43,115 each. Uh, total expense will be $86,130 funded through the uh, physical year 2019-21-22 CIP in the Opera Fund. Move for approval. Second. Second. Motion second. Please call the roll. Ms. Averwater? Aye. Ms. Gels Harris? Aye. Mr. Maxwell? Aye. Vice Mayor Shacklett? Aye. Mr. Wright? Aye. Mayor McFarland? Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. All right. Um, Old Fort Golf Course Renovation Project. Mr. Adams. Good evening, Mayor, uh, members of City Council. Tonight I'm asking you to consider the contract for the Old Fort Golf Course Renovation Project. Uh, with Wadsworth Golf Construction Company. Uh, back in 2021, back in 2021 uh, council approved a contract for renovation consultation design. Um, in uh, April of this year, uh, the funding was approved. So we uh, sought bids for the project. Wadsworth Golf Construction Company won the bid. Uh, the total cost of the contract is $1,422,114. It is fully funded uh, in the FY 21 and 22 CIP. Um, and so it'll be for uh, a full greens and bunker renovation, 
We'll also make some improvements uh, to hole number nine to the cart path and the, the uh, tee box there. So we'll also address some drainage issues on a few holes. And uh, main consideration or you know thing to know here is the golf course will be shut down for about four months uh, during the summer next year, but uh, it will be a better product in the end. And greens are over 20 something years old now. So I'll be happy to answer the questions you have. All right, any questions? Yeah. All right, do we have a motion? Move for approval. Second. <coughs> motion second. Ms. Brown, please call the roll. Ms. Averwater? Aye. Ms. Skills Harris? Aye. Mr. Maxwell? Aye. Vice Mayor Shacklett? Aye. Mr. Wright? Aye. Mayor McFarland? Aye. All right, we'll move to uh, the state SRO grant and MOU with Murfreesboro City Schools. Chief. Good evening, Mayor and members of the council. Uh, for your consideration is a request to approve application for the statewide SRO grant and MOU with Murfreesboro City Schools. Currently funds are available to law enforcement agencies who assign SROs to schools. After the agency completes submission of application for funding and an MOU between the law enforcement agency and the local education authority. Currently, MPD has 17 SROs on staff in 13 qualifying schools. This will allow us to receive a total of $975,000 annually, which will be used to offset salaries and benefits of the SROs currently on staff. And I can answer any questions that you may have. No questions. So moved. Second. Second. Oh. Fourth. Motion <laughs> a second, please call the roll. Ms. Saverwater? Aye. Ms. Skills Harris? Aye. Mr. Maxwell? Aye. Vice Mayor Shacklett? Aye. Mr. Wright? Aye. Mayor McFarland? Thank you. Aye. All right, we'll move to the purchase of vehicle equipment from on duty. Chief? Yes, sir. For your consideration is a request to purchase equipment to outfit 30 new police vehicles that were approved by council last year. The total cost of this purchase is $356,000. 356 $350 and is provided for the department uh, through the FY24 budget utilizing ARPA grant funding. I can so move. Second. second. Third. Motion second. Please call the roll. Ms. Averwater? Aye. Ms. Gills Harris? Aye. Mr. Maxwell? Aye. Vice Mayor Shacklett? Aye. Mr. Wright? Aye. Mayor McFarland? Aye. All right. We'll move to the purchase of body armor from Gauls. Chief. Yes, sir. For your consideration is a request to purchase 100 sets of body armor. Uh, they're approaching the expiration date uh, within the upcoming year. The current replacements are available through our current contract with Gauls for a total cost of $146,180. The cost of this purchase will be funded by the department's uh, FY24 budget. No questions. So moved. Second. Motion second. Please call the roll. Ms. Averwater? Aye. Ms. Gales Harris? Aye. Mr. Maxwell? Aye. Vice Mayor Shacklett? Aye. Mr. Wright? Aye. Mayor McFarland? Aye. Thank you all. <coughs> Thank you, Chief. Chief, you were asking for so much stuff, I thought you were Darren Gore up there. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Very nice. All right, we'll move to HVAC replacement at Reeves Rogers and Hobgood Elementary. Good evening again. HVAC renovations are required at Reeves Rogers Elementary and Hobgood Elementary after competitive bids were received and reviewed. X Energy Incorporated was awarded the contracts for these schools. The contract price for the HVAC renovations at Reeves Rogers is $1,293,000, and the renovations at Hobgood is $1,489,000. The total expense of $2.7 million is being funded through a grant received by the city schools in the ESSER 3 project. The school board approved these contracts at the August 8th school board meeting. Uh, Mr. Hennessy from the city um, administrative office is managing the project, and he or I are happy to answer any questions you may have. Let's keep those kids cool. Especially Low right move. now. Second. <laughs> Third. Motion second. Please call the roll. Ms. Averwater? Aye. Ms. Gales Harris? Aye. Mr. Maxwell? Aye. Vice Mayor Shacklett? Aye. Mr. Wright? Aye. Mayor McFarland? Aye. All right, we'll move to TDOT contract for Improve Act funds. 
Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I did, just for fun sometime, could we have planning and land use matters go last? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Every department head right now. <laughs> you know, the police and fire are thinking the same thing. <laughs> hey, so I can't, you, you are one of the first ones that have ever said what every single department member has been thinking, so. They're my friends, but seriously. Uh, the transportation department is requesting your approval of a contract with TDOT for $3 million in Improve Act funding to support the construction of our transit facility. Earlier this year, after a competitive uh, application process, the city was awarded $3 million with a 10% match requirement of $300,000. Um, this award is in addition to two previous awards of $3 million, bringing our total Improve Act funding to $9 million. Um, the city's matching funds on this and the previous awards are accounted for in the 2019 and 2022 capital investment program. Uh, so again, the transportation department recommends approval of this contract and I'll be happy to answer your questions. So moved. Second. Motion to second, please call the roll. Ms. Averwater. Aye. Ms. Skills Harris. Aye. Mr. <coughs> Maxwell. Aye. Vice Mayor Shacklett. Aye. Mr. Wright. Aye. Mayor McFarland. Aye. All right, we have no board and commission appointments. We have uh, some beer permits. We have one special event beer permit for an MTSU Foundation event on September 22nd. The applicant has met requirements for the permit and is recommended for approval pending the special event permit. So moved. Second. Motion to second, please call the roll. Ms. Averwater. Aye. Ms. Gels Harris. Aye. Mr. Maxwell. Aye. Vice Mayor Shacklett. Aye. Mr. Wright. Aye. Mayor McFarland. Aye. Any statements to be paid? No, sir. Any other business from staff? Mm -hmm. Mr. Gore. Yes, sir. Is there a beer permit? You've done really well tonight, Mr. Gore. I think this. No beer permit. <laughs> I forgot you were there. <laughs> Thank you. It's been tough. All right, any other business from council members? I just pass this out for everybody's edification. I emailed it to you during the, the middle of the meeting uh, with a timestamp. That way I wouldn't violate the Sunshine Law for our esteemed attorney down there. Um, but uh, yeah, I, kind of the thought came to me is what does everybody think about the Keystone Project? And so I, through, I have a survey monkey account and did an 11 mile radius and pushed it out uh, in Murfreesboro. And it was really just five questions. Do you support the project overall? Do you support a TIF? Do you feel the 5% hometown heroes program is too low or too high? Do you live in the city and do you intend to vote? And it was, it was I thought it might be 50, 50, 55, 45. It was very interesting. Over three, four, 77 percent of the respondents did not support the project as it is now, the hotel, condo, and apartments. Uh, over 87 percent did not support the TIF. Over 73 percent thought the 5 percent hometown heroes is too low. And 86 percent of the respondents live in the city and 87 percent said that they vote. So kind of my overall comments, and I'll take this from Councilman Shacklett, is that you know he likes to go out and do these listing sessions. I was trying to do some listing here just via a simple survey. So I think we owe it to ourselves as a council to make sure that we're getting exactly what we want if we move forward with this project. Uh, I'm like Councilman White, I want people downtown, but it's how do we want them downtown? Do we want them in? hotels, condos, or apartments. So you have it, it's in your inbox. You can click on the link, you can take a look at it. And I would encourage us, this as we go forward, that as a council, we be listening to what, you know, our citizens that elected us want. And I'll leave it at that. All right, any other business? All right, seeing none, we'll stand adjourned. <laughs>
the possibility of, of shifting that meeting to the 11th. And so we wanted to bring it to the Planning Commission for its consideration. And if 